uh, as you can see from the slide, 62 is actually one of the special interest groups under the topic area C, traffic management, operations, and safety. Uh, the manager of this topic area is Professor Zongtian from uh, University of Nevada at Reno. <clears throat> the focus of 62 is urban transport operations. Uh, we intended to promote international scientific activities, particularly in the field of urban traffic control, and meanwhile to encourage a closer commitment uh, among academics, practitioners, and the policy decision makers. Currently, I'm chairing this speaker along with uh, Professor Zongtian and Dr. At Satoliumi from the University of Tokyo. Uh, she is also the moderator of today's workshop. So far, uh, 62 has 40 members from 18 countries. Uh, although many of the members are from universities or research institutes, we have a good number of people from industry as well. For example, uh, Thomas uh, joining us today is he, uh, from a, a consulting company. Uh, for more details about WCTIS and the CC2, uh, you are welcome to visit the below website. Okay. Uh, in the year of uh, 2000, uh, 2017, WCTAS and Elsevier decided to publish co branded book series. And in this context, 62 planned three books on global practices on road traffic signal control. Uh, the first book, focuses on, excuse me. The first book focuses on fixed timed control at isolated intersections. And this book has been published in 2019. The editors of this book are Professor Manfred Borsa uh, from Technical University of Darmstadt, uh, Professor Hideki Nakamura from Nagoya University, Professor Zongtian and myself. Now it is available to purchase at the website of Elsevier indicated below. The second book will focus on arterial coordination signal control, which is also the topic of today's workshop. Now, uh, editorial team led by Professor Zong Tian is working on it. Professor Tian will report the latest progress uh, about this book later. The last book uh, will be about uh, accurate and adaptive control in the context of emerging technologies, such as uh, big data, connected vehicles, and autonomous driving. At the moment, we don't have a clear plan and an editorial team responsible for this book yet. Therefore, you're welcome to contact me if you are interested in being an editor or author of this book. So to, to better prepare for the second book uh, on arterial coordination signal control, we are organizing this online workshop series. Uh, the primary objective is to invite professionals from representative countries to share the state of the art practices and discuss the differences among these selected countries so that we can have a global picture about arterial coordination signal control so today we are having the first workshop uh, in which practices in USA, Germany, Switzerland, and China will be introduced and discussed. The second workshop is planned on January 26th uh, in 2021, uh, which will cover Japan, Australia, Korea, and the Middle East countries. Candidate speakers of this workshop are Professor Takashi Okuchi from the University of Tokyo, uh, Mr. Daniel Suter from Transmax, which is also the developer of a streams system. I think he's also joining us today. Uh, and Professor Jing Tai Kim from Korea National uh, University of Transportation and Dr. Waya Aha Jensen from Qatar University. The third workshop will take place in February or March in 2021. Uh, regarding the topic of this workshop, we are thinking of uh, latest research and practices in the context of uh, emerging technologies, as I mentioned before. 
So this is the agenda of today's workshop. Uh, we are very honored to have five experienced professionals from USA, Germany, uh, Switzerland, and China, respectively, to share with us about the latest development on arterial coordination signal control in their countries. Uh, the first speaker uh, is Professor Zhong Tian. He's a world-class researcher in the field of signal control, uh, particularly on arterial coordination signal control. Uh, he also has a quite long time of working experience in consulting companies. So he's basically very familiar with both research and practice. The second speaker is Professor Axel Wolfman from uh, Darmstadt University of Applied Science. Before the current position, he had worked at the University of Tokyo and the German Aerospace uh, Center, also known as DLR, for more than six years. He has uh, intensively involved with German guidelines on signal control as well. Uh, the third speaker is Dr. Thomas Lieder from uh, VSAG in uh, Switzerland. He is uh, currently the manager of the company and has more than 20 years of practical experience in signal control, is very familiar with uh, practices in particularly in European countries. The last two speakers are Professor Wan Jingma and Dr. Chen Hui Yu from my, my university. Professor Ma is a very active and protective research uh, in the field of uh, signal control. Meanwhile, he has also uh, done quite many consulting projects related to signal control. Chen Hui um, took his PhD uh, two years ago, I think, and he also spent two years at the University of Michigan as a visiting student before joining Tongji. He will present today on behalf of Professor Ma and himself. So I very much appreciate all the speakers uh, for sharing at this workshop. Without your support and contribution, this workshop wouldn't happen today. As for the program, I need to explain a slight change. Um, after talking with our speakers, we decided to allocate uh, 10 minutes for Q question and answer uh, right, after, right after each presentation. And then we will leave a few minutes at the end for group discussions. I hope for your kind and, and understandings on this change. So um, thank, you very thank you very much again for attending this workshop. I hope that everyone uh, can enjoy it. Uh, I think this is all for my opening. I will stop my screen sharing and pass the stage to my colleague, uh, Dr. Atsa Tolewumi. Atsa, uh, could you please go ahead? Yes, thank you. Thank you for your okay. good introduction, Professor Tan. So let's move to the presentation part. As Professor Tan introduced, my name is Azusa Toriumi, a research associate of the University of Tokyo. Thank you for participation today. I hope the discussion will be very fruitful for everyone in this workshop. So first presentation is about the progress report on the WCTL LDDL co-branded book of arterial coordination signal control provided by Professor Zontian. So Professor Zontian, please start your presentation. Thank you, Azusa. And uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, very good. And also, first, I would like to uh, really thank uh, Kershaw for organizing this workshop. I think it's very timely for us to, getting, uh, to get ready uh, for uh, producing the second book. So as you can see, um, I'm going to make a, basically two, two presentations. I will first talk about, uh, uh, provide a report of the status of the uh, second book. And then I'm going to talk about uh, arterial coordination um, in, in the US. So about the, the book, so I, I'm, yeah, Kershaw already taught, uh, I think, uh, provide, provided very detailed history. So I'm, go I'm going, to just going to be very brief. And I will focus on 
you know, the, the structure of the second book and also a kind of a, a publication timeline. After that, then I'm gonna talk about uh, the signal coordination uh, in the US, uh, North, America, North America practice. But just again to capture, you know, what was the really the um, purpose of publishing this book series? You know, the main purpose is really to try to promote WCTRS and outreach to transport practitioners, educators, and policymakers worldwide. So we want to produce something that is going to be useful, um, you know, not just for academia but also for practitioners. The first book led by Keshuang Tang, so already published, he already talked about that. So first book was mainly focusing on fixed time signal control. So the book was arranged, I don't know how many of you ha have actually uh, read the book. The first book was arranged really by country practices. So we had uh, a total of 12 countries the authors from 12 countries with each chapter documenting you know, how each country is, how, how each country really does the signal control, uh, determines signal timing, but it's an isolated fixed time. So that's pretty much for the first book. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, maybe somewhere you can you can see a more detailed information. Now about the second book, I think when Keshang mentioned uh, second book is mainly on coordination. Later, when we discussed among the four editors, we figured out, you know, if we talk about signal coordination we have to have a good understanding of actuated control. So that's the decision. So in fact, actuated control will have a chapter to di discuss the basic concepts of actuated control. Otherwise, you know, if we talk about coordination with actuation, so the readers may not have a good idea. So that's a little bit different from what uh, Kajran just mentioned. And also the focus is on conventional you know, signal coordination. So we're not going to cover adaptive system. So Kersan mentioned that maybe in the, the third book, so that's, that will be the focus talking about the emerging technologies in, including adaptive systems, right? So for the second book, it's just conventional coordination, not adaptive, not network. So that's the kind of a scope, okay? But we are going to cover both fixed time and actuated control. So the, which means coordination, okay? With the fixed, under fixed time and also under actuated control. The major difference you know, for this second book is that instead of you know, organizing this based on country practices, we actually, we are going to look at what are the representative practices. So when we discussed among our, the, the four editors, we realized it's probably there are not that many. Okay, North American NEMA-based signal coordination, definitely that is kind of a major, major kind. The European stage-based is another type. Okay, both we will address coordination with actuated control because that's, that is common, at least in North America, in, in the US, Canada, and in your, some European countries, not every your, your European countries, countries like Germany, Switzerland, so signal coordination, but with actua uh, uh, actuation. And then the rest of the world, the majority, in fact, the majority of the countries is probably still under fixed time control. So that's kind of the three themes that we figured out. And this is how the book is going to be 
uh, arranged to be written. So I'm going to show you uh, the next slide, uh, a kind of outline of the book. The four editors, myself, Thomas Riddell from uh, Switzerland, Axel Wolfman from uh, Germany, and Wen Jingma from China. So this is the uh, book structure. Uh, the discussion, yeah, we, 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 we had early discussion kind of to finalize uh, uh, the, the structure uh, of the second book. So the authors, you know, the authors who, who, who is going to lead the writing of the chapter. So I just put the name there. Okay. Uh, I didn't really uh, I, uh, talk to the, uh, the, uh, the editors on this, but we had some early discussions. We had some pretty good ideas, you know, who is, uh, who is, uh, who, who, who is specializing in a certain subject. So who might be the best person to lead um, the production of each chapter. But as you can see, the majority of the writing will be from just four of us. Now, I know we have other group members. So later, you know, maybe we, we, we can discuss. So the whoever would like to participate, you know, you can look at each chapter, you know, which part you think you can make a contribution. You can, you know, contribute to at least writing part of it, or maybe even providing a, a review of the chapter. So we can, we can, you know, we can talk about that later, but let me just give you, give you a brief idea, you know, uh, what exactly in each chapter that we're going to cover. Of course, the introduction, right? That just talk about the, the scope and purpose of the second book. The chapter two is about the signal facing concepts. This is where we are going to really dis, um, lay out um, the definitions of whether we call it the facing, we call it the stage. So because, you know, it's quite different how we call it. The face we call it here in the US is definitely different from other countries. So we're going to uh, describe those concepts, make sure everybody understands, ever the reader understands what the exact mean, what is a face, what is a stage. So that's the uh, chapter two. Chapter three, again, you know, it's about some basic concepts of actuated, actuated signal control. You know, how actuation works, signal actuation. Chapter four is about the co arterial coordination principles. This is where we are going to talk about the key elements, key parameters, like cycle length, phase split, phasing sequence offset, you know, in general, how to determine these major parameters and the general process of developing a signal coordination plan. Chapter five will describe the development process. So this is where uh, you are gonna see it when I present the US practice. So I'm gonna just outline how we do, do it here in the US. And of course, it's also going, going to include an example, a real case. So make sure you know somebody can refer to this is in fact it's a real project. This is how we do a signal timing, signal coordination from the beginning to the end. Chapter six is about uh, signal coordination considering other modes. So a lot of signal coordination definitely deals still deals with uh, vehicle uh, vehicle movement, but we we have other modes. You know, pedestrian is one thing, bicycle, public transit, light rail, you know, buses. So these kind of other modes, you know, how do we consider them when we try to coordinate arterials? Chapter seven. Is about signal control with uh, connected, connected and automated vehicles because you know this is a future trend. So we have to provide some kind of guidance 
or future perspective, you know, how future signal control would accommodate this type of emerging uh, technologies. Chapter eight is about the special cases in other countries. So as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're gonna talk about some in you know, the US practice, uh, European practice with some typical examples. But in other countries, there might be something that we don't know. Okay, I, I'm not very familiar with what other countries um, do, except a few countries. So there might be some special cases, you know, special, either special facing, special intersection design. So this is, you know, this is where after we hearing the, the presentations from different countries, we may get a better idea, you know, what other special cases we would include in this chapter. So the final one is just a summary and outlook. So pretty much this is the, uh, the, the structure of the book. Like I said, okay, you look at um, the leading authors of each chapter. Okay, think about which part you would like to contribute and then either talk to myself or talk to the leading author directly. So indicating you know, I would like to participate. This is how I can contribute. In terms of a uh, timeline, all right, so uh, I do take the responsibility. So I know I'm running a little bit behind, but still we need to have a timeline. We need to have a schedule. So this is what I'm proposing by January 15th. I'm gonna uh, submit the, uh, the book proposal so it's going to take a, a couple of months probably for the review and the approval. Um, so at that, that timeline, I wasn't sure, maybe Kershaw has, has had a better idea how long it's going to take. But I think starting January, at least starting the new year, even though we are waiting for the approval, I'm going to start to write the chapters that I'm responsible and I would encourage the other uh, editors to do the same thing. So get things started earlier. Don't just wait until the book is approved. I think uh, um, very, very highly likely our proposal will be uh, approved. So the first draft, first draft chapters, so probably you know, after we hear the official approval, in six months, um, we need to submit our draft chapters. That's why I'm saying, you know, let's get started earlier. Okay, don't wait until uh, until you, we hear the final approval and then you start to, to the writing. So it may take longer than you than you think. So we're going to have. Um, in the first round review, uh, last time when we um, produced the first book, actually the uh, the major authors we had a gathering. We spent three three days in China, Tongji University, hosted by Tongji University. So we spent spent three days there. Uh, each person uh, is responsible for a certain chapter. So we did capture a lot of things. We we provided very good feedbacks to. To the uh, to the authors, and the, eventually we got a much better um, second draft. Um, I'm hoping by that time the pandemic is over, so we are going to do something similar. And I'm hoping Tongji, I guess, uh, what well, Tongji is an ideal place, and they have the facilities, they have the the resources to host such a, a gathering. That's my hope. The final version, you know, submission, you know, uh, after we, um, we, we sent the uh, second draft, we hear some uh, comments back, um, we, maybe one, one month or so, we submit the final version. So the, 
in general, uh, I estimate it will take uh, at least a year to get it fi uh, finally published. So that's pretty much um, about this, the book. I don't know whether we should pause here for a few more, for a few questions, or I should just continue with my presentation. Azusa, I let you. Yeah, if the audience have some quick, quick, quick question about the book, I would like to have one or two. So if you have a question, could you raise your hand in the Zoom function? Or just uh, unmute and uh, say something. Okay, it seems there's no questions. So, I just saw. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Professor Tom, please. Yeah, it, it's not a question. Uh, as uh, Professor Tian mentioned about the time for review and approval, according to my experience, it will be two months, up, up to two months, I think, uh, quite quick. And I think. Uh, the proposal will be approved uh, since it is under the framework of uh, WCTIS and elsewhere co-branded book series. So that's one thing. Second, uh, you also mentioned that you are going to have an uh, author awesome meeting or editorial meeting uh, at Tongji. Uh, for this, I will talk with Wang Jing. I think it's possible so we can uh, organize this meeting. That's my uh, responses to uh, Professor Tian's uh, questions. Yeah, thank you, Kershaw. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that, you know, that is very productive. We just get together, you know, without doing anything else. And so uh, I, I felt it, it was quite a productive. Okay. That kind of a gathering. Okay. All right. Thank so you. so, so you I can. Uh, would move to okay. your presentation about arterial coordination. All right, so I'm going to uh, proceed with my second presentation. This is about arterial coordination North America practice. Since I only have 20 minutes, so I need, really need, need, to, need to go kind of fast. I, I know this is, has been recorded, so if you couldn't catch it, you can always go back to review the videos later. So I'm going to talk about briefly the NEMA signal facing because that's how um, what, what we use here in the US, in North America, and the key signal coordination parameters, the timing plan development process, and the case. So the NEMA structure, okay. For a typical intersection, you know, here is a standard intersection with four legs, You can see we, I marked all the, the left turn movements, the through movements, but I didn't mark the right turn. So there's also right turn, right? But if you're familiar with the signal control, you understand in general, right turn doesn't need a separate control. So right turn can be combined with its adjacent through, okay? That's why we only have eight movements. And if we want eight movements you know, to be protected, so each one is a phase. This is a, how we define a signal phase. So in Europe, so this is a kind of equivalent to the signal group. So for a typical intersection with four legs, Okay, there are eight phases. And the way we number those eight, eight phases, actually there's a reason. You can see the left turns. We use odd number, one, three, five, seven. Okay, the throughs, we use even number, okay, two, six, four, eight. So this is the ring barrier structure. So this is called a barrier. You look at the, on one side of the barrier, one, two, five, six, it's happening on east-west. 
Okay, in this case, east-west. Of course, it can also be north-south. Okay, so I'm just using this case, east-west. On the second barrier, three, four, seven, eight, you can see the faces is all on the north-south direction. Okay, so the barrier means you need to terminate these faces at the same time. So that means we are going to switch the directions. Okay. So Europe is different. Later you are going to hear a different presentation. So they, they don't really have this physical barrier, but in the US, this barrier will force the faces to terminate simultaneously. And the, the face, you look at the face, one, two. We call this ring one, one, two, three, four. Then there's ring two, five, six, seven, eight. All the faces in the same ring, you can see they're all conflicting faces. So one, two can never come on together. Okay, three, four can never come on together. And then five, six, the same thing, seven, eight. But the faces in the different rings, they do not conflict. For example, one and the five, no conflict. They can go together. Two and five, no conflict. They can go together, right? So this is the basic NEMA ring barrier structure. Okay, if you just operate the signal in this way, so there will be no conflict. And, and very efficient. Efficient means in a, during a certain time, we can serve two phases simultaneously. So there's a NEMA and then in most other countries, you know, they use called a stage. In fact, you know, there's a direct connection between NEMA phases versus stage. So I'm just using uh, the, the barrier one phases as an example. If you look at one, two, five, six, you convert that into stage. So we are going to have stage A, B, C. I'm using A, B, C, okay? A, the two left turns go together. You know, the two left turns, one could be longer than the other. So in this case, five is longer than five than one. So one will terminate and then five will continue and there's two. So we, we have the second stage, two and five. And the third stage is two and six. Okay, then the barrier and you start north-south. Okay, so you can see the NEMA phase and the stages, they are directly related. Or it could be like this, you know, in this case, one is longer than five. And then we still have three stages, but the second stage will be one and six because one is longer than five. Five terminates earlier. So I kind of uh, provide a quick summary. So exactly how do we really interpret an EMA phase versus stage? You think about NEMA phase is really focused on a movement, or you, th you can think of each phase is tied to a signal head, you know, a left turn signal head, a through signal head. Okay, you, can, you can think of it that way. Versus the interval, so each interval you can see the signal display is consistent. There's no change of signal display within the same interval. So this is how uh, I try to differentiate, provide a better um, definition or relationship uh, between NEMA phase versus stage. This is another, you know, NEMA versus stage, but with a different facing sequence. So as you know, facing sequence, in fact, is very important for coordination. So this is called the lead-like facing sequence. So why we call the lead-like? You can see the sequence we switched one and two. So 
one direction left turn is leading, the other direction left turn is lagging. But you convert that into a stage, it's going to be like this. A, stage A is 25, stage B, 26, stage C, 1 and 6. Because late, I, I want you to understand the relationship because later when I present the example, the US example is going to be all on NEMA phases. The key parameters, I'm pretty sure this is, uh, diff this is the same for all the other countries. I, I think uh, uh, in an email exchange, Excel mentioned, you know, the, the practice in Europe, we develop a timing based on fixed time, but operate with actuated. So that's exactly, yeah, exactly right. In the US, it's the same thing. You look at everything here, it looks like a fixed time. But when it's actually uh, run the coordination, so there's actuation, okay? So there are further details we need to, we, we need to uh, describe. But the key parameters, cycle length, right? But cycle length, if we call it coordinated, therefore cycle length must be in multiples. For example, 100, 120, 60, 60 is called half cycle, or 180. Okay, so these are all in multiples. Okay, you cannot have 120 and 100, 111. You call it coordinate because it's, a, it's going to never, never hit the, the coordination point. So that cycle, phase splits. Okay, here earlier, you see when I described the phase, so you think about, let's say phase five is a left turn phase, right? Phase, phase two is a through phase. So each phase has a duration of green time, yellow, and red clearance. Okay, red clearance, uh, we used to call it all red time. So phase splits, in fact, when we say phase splits, that includes green, yellow, plus red clearance. And then the offset. Okay, offset, because in I know in some other countries, um, they interpret offset maybe differently. So they, for example, some, some countries, they, they, they think offset is just one intersection relative to the neighboring intersection, okay? Here, the offset, the concept is, is uh, we call it uh, absolute offset. So all the signals is all referencing to a common clock, a common master clock. So when we define the offset, you must clearly define which phase you are referencing to and the referencing point because each phase has the green, starting green, end green, starting yellow, end yellow, right? So you have to specify which point you are referencing. And then phasing sequence. So you think about eight phases, you know, for typical intersection, eight phases, how many different phasing combinations we can have? You know, switch one, two, that's one sequence. And switch one, six, five, six is another sequence. So with eight phases, four pairs, there are 16 different combinations of phasing sequences. Okay, so in fact, we each phasing sequence, we have a code. So from one to 16. Now pedestrian. Earlier I mentioned, yeah, pedestrian is not, it's a non-vehicle mode. How do we handle pedestrians? So either pedestrian or public transit, at least currently in the US, is, is all somehow related to a parent vehicle phase. Okay, we call it concurrent with the vehicle phase. For example, if this is a vehicle phase, let's say phase two, in the, it has a green, has yellow, has a, all red, which is the red clearance. So the pedestrian phase is always embedded with, within this phase two. So phase two will have a portion of walk, flashing through the walk, 
But because actuated control, if you don't press the button, there's nobody press the button, it's not going to bring the walk, flashing don't walk. However, if somebody press the button, walk comes on, flash don't walk comes on, so the vehicle green has to be at least the minimum of walk and the flash don't walk. I know I need to watch my time, so I need to just uh, try to go a little bit faster. Here, here's one example. An intersection with eight faces. Okay, this is how we define them. You can see the cycle, 140, offset, referencing phase six, referring to begin yellow. So you look at the bottom, okay? So this is the facing sequence. Here's the phase six referring to the beginning of yellow, which is also the end of green. Phase split in general is always the integer, but because yellow and the right time can be in decimals, so green can be also in decimals. You, oh, you can also see the walk, flashing don't walk, is just part of the vehicle phase, okay? How does signal coordination work? So there's a video. I don't think I have time to play this video. I produced this video to make sure you know, people can learn from this video to understand how signal coordination work, particularly under actuated control, okay? So I'm not going to play this video. However, I'm going to advertise my personal LinkedIn page again, so you, follow my LinkedIn page, I post a lot of these kind of educational videos. You can, you can visit my LinkedIn page and look at all different type of videos for you to understand um, signal control, better understand the signal control. The signal timing development process, this is probably also universal. You start with the data collection, you're collecting necessary data, um, such as geometry, speed, spacing, volume, so these kind of things. And then build a, some sort of a software model. In the US, uh, Synchro is the predominant software. So besides Synchro, there's a, a, another software called True Traffic and also TransSync. So in, in, in fact, TransSync uh, the start, the development started from here. So I kind of uh, guided development of this software. It's relatively new, but it's uh, starting to get to, to be recognized by agencies. So there are a lot of us, uh, we already have a lot of agencies adopting this too. Um, so all the examples I, I, sh I show here is actually produced based on that. So after the software, you, 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 know, you do the optimization, develop the timing, then the field implementation. After that, you do the before after evaluation. So current practice is still do the floating car travel runs. And then you maintain the signal timing. So that's pretty much the overall uh, timing development process. But signal coordination under actuation there are a few challenges. Now, for example, how many timing plans do we need? Okay, typically AM, midday, PM, off-peak, weekend, special events. So these are common. And also in the coordination, you know, we don't run coordination throughout the day. At night, when traffic volume is low, we turn the coordination off. So that means to turn the signal into a fully actuated. But how to determine that? And so these are the issues we have to deal with. Signal transition, okay, because there are preemption vehicles, there are emergency vehicles to cause preemption, to cause, cause a signal transition. Sometimes if we don't handle the pedestrians correctly, it could, could also cause signal into transition. And the pedestrian treatment is a major issue uh, this is something I know if you only run fixed time, you, don't, you probably don't understand this concept. So here, when we design the timing, when we provide the phase split, you know, there, we have a choice. Either with the split, we accommodate the pedestrian crossing time, or not accommodate pedestrian crossing time, okay? 
So this is a, a major issue. And uh, there, I, I don't think I have time to discuss the details here, but definitely in the book, we need to describe you know, how, how that does work. So here are the, you know, how do we determine these parameters? Uh, again, so I just list a few things, but the actual determination is that we, we more complicated than this. So at least the book needs to describe the process of, of designing a cycle length phase split, the sequence offset, and also other actuated control settings. As I mentioned, they are not a part of the coordination plan, but is part of the operation. So we have to also deal with those parameters. So finally, I want to show you a real case. So using one arterial in Las Vegas, so zoom in, okay. So we have, in this case, 11 intersections. I'm only going to show you one intersection, how the timing look like. So this one intersection, you can see eight faces, okay. So this is the actual timing sheets. This is how you, you program the parameters into the, the controller. Eight phases you can see, okay, phase one, two, eight. So each phase, if there's a pedestrian crossing, pedestrian crossing is mainly tied to the through phases. So the even numbers, you can see the walk time is programmed 12 seconds, pedestrian clearance time, 33 seconds. And then the other, so these other ones actually are not related to coordination. Those are actuated parameters. Of course, yellow, red is all, always part of the signal phase. So I only highlighted those relevant to coordination. So there are many other parameters that are not really related to coordination plan. Because we have many different timing plans, here we call it a pattern. So each pattern, there's a cycle length, say cycle time, offset, split number, that split number is, is a table number. So you need to look at table 21. And the sequence, I told you there are 16 different sequence code. So this pattern 21 is a midday plan with this cycle and the phase split uh, offset. Then you look at the details, this is the pattern one. Okay, there's again, eight phases. These are the phase split. Phase split that includes yellow and red and green. So you can see phase one, 27 here, here. phase two, 75. So this is how it's showing in, in, in the software, in the graphical display, but this is how it's programmed in the controller. Which one is the coordinate phase? You look at here, uh, there's a coordinate phase of, 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 of on. So on is phase six. So that means phase six is the coordinate phase. It's referencing again, the begin of yellow. Okay, so this is for this particular intersection. So each intersection you need to put the timing in like this. And then to show the coordination, time space diagram, I'm pretty sure in other countries is the same thing. Time space diagram is the most commonly used tool to show a signal coordination plan. So here's the time space diagram. And on the right, you can see the detailed phase split and the sequence. The, these are the offset values and referencing point, okay? And the time space diagram also shows the distance between intersections, the speed of travel time in both directions. So this is a timing plan, okay? Obviously this is a fixed time, but in, in real time when it's, uh, it's actually running, it's not, in, not going to go exactly like this. Again, that's the uh, sample intersection I showed you earlier. Okay, I just enlarged it you, so that you can see the details, the offset value, phase split. So later you can review the video. So after the timing is implemented, we have to do before after travel runs to evaluate the quality of the signal timing. So these are the vehicle trajectories. You can see the vehicle traveling within the band without stop, okay? As you can see, the speed of the vehicle is actually, uh, it's not always the same as what you 
used to, to design uh, the timing plan. Okay, so you heard the bandwidth. You know, bandwidth is one measure to measure the quality of a signal timing, but the final evaluation should be based on the actual travel runs, but not just purely the bandwidth. And the, this is a part of the evaluation. You know, before after study is one thing. You compare before after. So this is what we call it the performance index. So based on the travel runs, we gave you a, a, a grid level, gave you some scores. So in this case is C. So C means, okay, it's not close to A. So that means you can still do better. So this is part of the evaluation process. So pretty much that's, uh, you know, uh, that's what I, I can cover uh, within this amount of time. Probably I already run over time. Just a final note, okay. A consideration of other modes in the US like transit bicycle is still, still rare. It's mainly just uh, uh, focusing on vehicles. So signal control controllers have many features to handle issues with the actual control during coordination. Uh, so that's why understand actual control is actually very important. So the, because of actuation, so the, the time diagnosis becomes really challenging in the field. So when, you know, whether the timing is uh, considered good or bad, you know, driver expectation actually plays a major role. Okay, it's not just uh, how many stops, uh, what's the travel time, it's how drivers feel. So therefore, when we evaluate the signal timing, driver expectation, okay, you shouldn't, you, you, you cannot neglect a driver's perception. So with that, this, um, I conclude my presentation. I hope, hopefully I didn't use too much time. Thank you for your presentation, Professor Tan. So would you have any questions, please raise your hand or unmute and ask questions to Professor Tan. May I ask just a quick question about the evaluation by the floating curve? How frequently do you review uh, such a evaluation and uh, improve or change the timing? Well, here in general, you do that only when a signal retiming project is done. Okay. So, you know, uh, it's not common we, we do this regularly. So we feel, okay, there's a signal timing project that needs to be done. So go there to collect the before travel runs. And then you finish the signal timing and then do the after run so that you can compare. I see, okay. thank you. But sometimes traffic condition may change and the, the coordination doesn't match to the current condition. That's what I'm concerned. But I understand that many in many countries such kind of frequent variation are difficult. Yeah. Okay, we have a one question from in the chat from Maria Salmons. Okay. How do you do evaluate driver expectation? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, driver expectation. Well, it, it's uh, it's hard to quantitatively evaluate. But in general, we, we understand what drivers care about. For example, you know, if I'm on the main street, I would expect go through many signals without stopping. If I come from the side street, if I make a stop, I'm okay. So therefore, we cannot treat the stop similarly you know, a stop made by a major street vehicle versus by a minor street vehicle. So this is a part of the uh, driver expectation. And also the same number of stops. Okay, if you make one stop and immediately after that you made another stop, so two stops, versus you make one stop and you go through a couple of signals, then you make another stop you know, that also creates a different driver's perception. So we try to capture as much as, I, as we can when we produce this, this sort of uh, uh, performance index. So we, we, you know, it's all empirical based. It's really hard to 
to um, scientifically defend. Why do you give that score? You know, how, how, what's your uh, what's the justification? So it's all pretty much empirical based. And the idea is, you know, we provide a score and we call different engineers. So you tell me your driver ex driving experience, does this match your expectation? So as long as this match their expectation, we call it good. So that's really the idea behind this distance type of performance index and ca uh, capturing driver's expectation. Thank you. Okay, for the last question in the chat, uh, in the US, do all area follow this method? That was a question by Daniel. Uh, okay, G given the diversity of our organization, then yes. do all areas follow this method? Are also are the signal timing updates performed by the government or private gauge or mix? Okay. Um, the, the, the first answer is, is definitely no. Uh, the performance index, in fact, is, is something relatively new. Um, there's uh, only one agency so far in, in Southern California, they use this type of a performance index. I see this is the future direction because without such a established performance index, it's just very hard to argue. You know, what is considered good? What is considered bad? Or even you improved over the before, how do you know there, uh, there, whether there's still room to further improve? So this is where I see the future direction. We need something like this, just like intersection level of service. All right, the second part of the question is, uh, who does the signal timing? Is the government, uh, private, or mix? So it's really a mix. Uh, there are a lot of uh, um, agencies, they do the signal timing in-house by the staff of their own. There are a lot of also agencies, they hire consulting companies to do the timing. So it's, it's, it's really a mix. Mm -hmm. Thank you for Professor Tian. Yeah, actually still there is a question in the chat, but due to the time limit, we would like to move to the next presentation. So P Professor Tian, could you please answer in the chat to the other questions? Thank you for what, your- What is the other question? Yeah, by Xiao Fen Li in the chat. Okay, hold on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I have one minor question. For after evaluation study, how long time we need give so drivers to get in, used? Huh? Yeah, could you please answer in the chat? Chat function? Yeah, I, yeah, I know. I'm I'm just reading reading the question, so oh, okay. make sure. Uh, okay. So his his question is uh, how long, how long do we need to give uh, give drivers to get used to the new timing before going to collect the data? Well. Uh, <laughs> Well, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I don't think there's, there's a, a definite answer for that. I would say uh, you should do that. You, you don't want to wait it for too long because of single timing project, there's always a, a timeline. By that time, you, you have to charge the agency, you, you, have, you have to get paid. So I, I would say, um, you know, after you think my timing is, uh, is finalized, you 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 should you should be able to to just do the the, the, the uh, data collection. The drivers it won't take them much time to get used to the new timing. They may not even uh, re realize that the change. Uh, they can see better, but but I don't think it is it's really going to take long uh, for them to recognize any change. But I know Xiao Feng is from from uh, uh, Tucson Tucson Arizona. Over there is quite different because their facing sequence, they have been using the same facing sequence for many, many years. Suddenly you change the facing sequence, everybody will recognize it. So they start to complain. So I, I, maybe that's where his question, where the questions come from. Okay, thank you. So let's move to the next presentation. Thank you, Professor Tian. So the next presentation will be about the Arterial coordination in Germany and Switzerland by Professor Axel Wolfman and Dr. Thomas Wiegel. So, could you please switch your screen? Yeah, good morning, everyone. <coughs> Thank you very much for having me. 
we are a little bit over time, but um, some things I wanted to explain, Jim already explained, so I can be a little quicker, I hope. So my presentation will be the first part um, of two presentations. Um, Thomas will um, take over and explain more the practical issues and he will have a look at Switzerland. I will explain more the basics in Germany. So my agenda is that I will first give some background about signal control in Germany, what, what is special, some things um, Tien already mentioned, differences towards the US, for instance. Um, I will explain something about road hierarchy and street layout, which might be a little different to some other countries, and then go into the artery coordination procedure. And um, most of the, the talk will be regarding the challenges um, we have with the arterial coordination and that is public transport and recently also increasingly cyclists and in the end i will give a short outlook on traffic actuation and um, the combination with coordination but probably thomas will go into more detail on that so first let me start um, about the signals um, signals in germany or in Many European countries are on the upstream side of the intersection, not on the far side. So once you enter the intersection, you cannot see the signals any, anymore. It makes um, some difference also regarding intergreen timing. We have probably the same uh, signal sequence like most countries uh, with, red and, uh, uh, with red, green and yellow, but we also have a red and yellow um, transition phase of one second. So drivers are always warns about the impending signal change to green, which makes it a little more efficient. <clears throat> a big difference is that we don't calculate yellow time and red clearance intervals separately from each other. The yellow intervals is a fixed interval in Germany and it depends only on the speed limit. So for 50 kilometers per hour, so urban streets, we have three seconds. For um, high-speed intersections, or high-speed means up to 70 kilometers per hour, yellow time can be four seconds or five seconds, and this is a fixed interval. And intergreen times are computed independently, and intergreen time means yellow interval and red clearance together. We do have arrow signals, and um, those arrow signals mean that we have no shared turns in this phase. That means if you have an arrow signals, then there is no conflicting or there's not allowed to be any conflicting movement, neither from pedestrians nor from cars or cyclists. So this is really a protected pace. And we have no general right turn on red. So we have this green fixed arrow, which is not a signal, but which is a, a traffic sign. Um, only where we have this arrow, we have right turn on red, and this arrow is pretty rare. So it was introduced, but it was not really successful. So usually we have no right turn on red. We do have specialized signals for public transport. Basically, those signals are for trams, but they are used for buses as well. So if we have a bus on a dedicated lane, or if we have trams, then we have those signals. Basically, they work the same like the red, green, and yellow signals. And um, in some cases, which is important for coordination, we do have the speed advisory signs, which signal the, the speed you have to drive to reach the next signal at green. Those kind of speed signals are usually used if the distance between coordinated intersections is very big. So Tian already explained about the difference between phases, which are called signal groups in Germany, intergreen I mentioned, and maybe here a short explanation how um, a signal timing diagram in Germany would look like. And there we have the stages, and the stage includes um, all uh, or the, the portion of the time where the signals don't change at all. So in Germany, a stage does not include the yellow time and red clearance interval. So therefore, in Germany, I would consider the, the green split, well, we don't have the term, but the green split would relate to the green time and not to red clearance and yellow intervals. So Ken already explained about the difference between the ring barrier diagram and the stage sequence diagram. So this, in Germany, we don't use the ring barrier diagram. We use a so-called stage sequence diagram, 
So what we see on the left here, part of a ring barrier diagram would look like um, the pictures on the right in Germany. So the first um, stage would be the left turning traffic in both directions. Then we end the left turning traffic from the south and would add the um, through and right turning movements. And then we have the two through movements. So you see here the difference. Well, we also indicate the red turning movement because that can be on a separate lane in Germany as well. So this is a stage sequence diagram. And one major difference is also, we also add in the stage sequence diagram all um, kind of traffic streams, including pedestrians and separately signaled cyclists. So in our case, we would have the pedestrians parallel to the um, through movement, which is in indicated here. So that's how a part of the stage sequence diagram would look like in Germany. And one difference also is basically all the different or the 16 different combinations Tien mentioned in Germany, they, they can be signaled in Germany as well, but leading left turn is considered unsafe in Germany. It's possible, but it's pretty uncommon. So it is considered unsafe because they say, well, if you have the right of way as a left turn in traffic and then the through movement starts and suddenly you have to give right of way to the oncoming traffic, and um, that's considered unsafe and um, therefore we try to avoid that. And that limits you in the kind of stage sequences which are common in Germany. Probably the same like in, in most countries, we have movements without a conflict. Um, we have movements which have a conflict which cannot be signaled in the same stage. And we have movements with shared turns, so permissive stages. Here, the, the first case that we have the right turning traffic together with the pedestrians, that is the, the common procedure in Germany. On the bottom, having through traffic and left turning traffic, that is considered generally unsafe to not signal it in a, in a separate stage. So we do have it, it's still common, but the research shows us that this leads to many heavy accidents and um, therefore we nowadays try to avoid it and uh, the research also shows that usually it doesn't cost you capacity if you signal it in a separate stage because even if you have it as a shared turn usually the left turning traffic have, has to wait and therefore the capacity doesn't change so much so particularly if you have high traffic volumes um, we try to separate the left turning traffic separately. Let's have a look at um, how streets in Germany look like. So here I showed you some pictures from cities um, in Germany. The left pictures are from Berlin. The right um, picture is from Freiburg, a little smaller town. But basically our arterials usually have one or two lanes. In some cases, more than two lanes, but that's already a pretty big street. We only have in the very big uh, cities. Um, at the intersections, of course, there can be more than two lanes. That's um, pretty apparent, but on the, uh, between the intersections, two lanes is usually most you have. And what those pictures also show, we always have mixed kind of traffic. So we have public transport, which quite commonly uses the normal vehicle lanes. We have cyclists. Nowadays, we try to provide separate facilities, but in many cases, we don't have separate fa facilities. <clears throat> so a situation like in the middle picture is pretty common. If we look at the, uh, or, and I should mention that um, usually the general speed limit in Germany is 50 kilometers per hour. We are discussing nowadays um, to reduce the speed limit. I will talk about that a little later on. But on the major streets, 50 is, is the basic speed limit. If you look at the little smaller streets, then usually we're talking about um, one lane per direction. Um, what is important is we have a lot of street side parking in Germany. Most of the streets have street side parking in Germany, which causes all kinds of headaches, but that's the norm. People expect that and, and therefore it's the very common situation. Um, sometimes we have minor streets which are pretty narrow. Those streets, of course, are not signalized and not part of a um, coordinated corridor. That is basically the, the kind of streets 
we have which enter into the coordinated corridor. If we look into street networks, what, we, what is very common in Germany is we, most of our cities are very old cities and therefore those cities have um, a very old city center and they started growing around the city center over the centuries and this is still reflected in the current street layout. So this uh, is a um, part of the, the city of Darmstadt where I um, work and live in and on the right hand side you see all the signalized intersections, every red dot is a signalized intersection um, and um, on those corridors you have quite a few corridors which are coordinated, it's not all of them but um, some of the, the corridors which are uh, coordinated and what I try to highlight is this street network is very irregular so we don't have this typical chessboard uh, kind of um, or block block pattern we have in the US quite commonly. So we have a lot of, uh, well, angles and rounded streets and they um, intersect at different points with each other, which makes coordination already mathematically quite challenging, if not impossible. So already here you have to define priorities, which kind of, uh, in, uh, which kind of street um, you would like to, co to, to coordinate and which kind of streets has my priority. So arterial coordination is very popular in Germany. So it's one of the common procedures we try to pursue in many cities, if we can. So what um, is the reason why they are so popular? I call it riding on the green wave and it uh, kind of alludes to the question uh, we had before about um, what is the driver expectation. So the driver expectation is to ride on the green wave. But also theory coordinations are very easy to realize or easy in terms of the engineer can easily um, understand the procedures. You don't need any detectors to realize it. You can use it with fixed time control. You don't need sophisticated computers or simulations. You basically can do it on, on paper. So you, you already could do it decades ago without problems. And you don't um, need specialized knowledge. So it's pretty uh, easy to understand. Um, and you don't have, a, have to be a specialist working for decades in single control to be able to um, realize it. And on the other side, for the drivers, it's very easy to understand. <clears throat> it's a very easy concept. You understand that if you drive on a corridor, you can expect that you have the green lights on every signal. That's the expectation. And you easily realize whether it's fulfilled or not. If you're talking about network control, adaptive control, the driver is not able to understand what's happening. What are the optimization criteria? And that's the big difference. <clears throat> And one important reason is also it improves the travel experiences on the arterials and that therefore makes those arterials more attractive. So we discourage the use of the minor roads, which we want. We want to have the, most of the traffic volumes on the arterials and we encourage that by using uh, the green wave or arterial coordination on those streets. And it is well established, it's used for decades now in Germany, so it's a procedure um, everyone knows. If we oppose it to network control or model-based optimization, um, an alternative to this arterial coordination, this needs a lot of detectors, it needs good computers and simulation, it needs a lot of specialized knowledge. Drivers cannot understand what's going on, it's not intuitive. And we have a few examples in Germany where um, this kind of adaptive control or network control was realized, but um, those experiences have not been very successful for various reasons. So basically that's the reason why we stick, still stick to pretty basic traffic actuation and well, it's not really basic nowadays, but still it's kind of fixed time based traffic actuation and also arterial control.
Let's look at the challenges for arterial coordination. So where are the limits for realizing that? <clears throat> we have a, a lot of requirements for good arterial co uh, coordination. Well, the first of uh, them, Tian already mentioned them, we need a common cycle time, of course. We need moderate capacity utilization. If our network is overloaded, if we have too high uh, utilization, then uh, the coordination will not work anymore. So we have to make sure that we don't have too much traffic in the streets. Best is if we have more than one lane per direction. So if we have slow traffic, it can be overtaken. Best is if we don't have street side parking because street side parking means interruptions in the traffic flow. If there is a parking car right when the um, traffic platoon arrives, then this platoon will not be able to pass. We should have turning lanes at the intersections so that the through traffic has its own lanes, separate lanes. Distance of intersections should be less than one kilo kilometer. If it's bigger than, let's say, 700, 800 meters, usually the platoon starts to, to dissipate and therefore the coordination doesn't work nicely. For the long distances, I mentioned already the speed signals where you can try to keep the platoon together, but it becomes more and more challenging. We should, uh, zebra crossings are pretty common in Germany, particularly for, for school routes or for um, important pedestrian routes. And of course, as pedestrians have priority at zebra crossings, they would destroy your coordination. So no zebra crossings um, in coordination. And the other reason is if we have coordination, then it would be very dangerous for pedestrians to cross because drivers tend to not um, obey the or give way to the pedestrians if they know they will miss the green light. So the problem is to find all a combination of all those conditions is very rare. On the right hand side you see again the city of Darmstadt with um, most of the coordinated corridors and all the corridors which are highlighted um, with this kind of orange orange uh, color means here we don't have this kind of situation. So either those corridors have higher capacity, they have less than two lanes, they have street side parking or some, some other conditions is violated. So you see in many cities we have the challenge that those conditions are rarely to be found. First challenge. Second challenge is our guidelines say that in the coordination we should take into consideration not only motorized vehicles, but also public transport, pedestrians, cyclists, emergency services. All of them should be considered somehow in the coordination. If we have a progression speed, well, we know that um, those coordination work nicely if we have a progression speed, which equals about 90 to 100% of our speed limit. It means about 45 to 50 kilometers per hour. And that means much higher than cyclists. And it also means that as soon as we have some bus or tram which stops somewhere on this arterial, it doesn't, or it doesn't necessarily work anymore. We will look at that later on. The second challenge is two-way coordination. Quite commonly, we have corridors where we don't have a dominant traffic direction, or maybe we have a dominant direction, but it's only slightly dominant. It's not that we have all the traffic in one direction and the opposite direction has nearly no traffic. Quite commonly, we have traffic in different directions at the same time. And then we try to realize the coordination in both directions. So we try not only in this direction, but also in the opposite direction to have traffic coordination. What you can see here is, <clears throat> if we want to realize it in a nice way, depending on our signal program, we try to give green in, the, in one direction and the opposite direction, more or less at the same time. We, we saw those ring barrier diagrams. We have some possibility to combine through traffic with the left turning traffic. And in this time, in this way, the opposing or inbound and outbound traffic doesn't have to be necessary to have through, tra uh, through green at the same time. But if we have that, then usually it's easier to um, develop signal plans which work nicely for all directions. And this, situ uh, this situation is given if 
the intersection spacing is in a way that the, the um, offset from one direction, uh, from one intersection to the next, and the offset in the opposite direction equals some uh, multiple of the cycle time, or basically the cycle time or a multiple of it. And here you see what that mathematically means. That means depending on the cycle time, here on the x-axis you have the cycle time, here you have different progression speeds. This is the optimal intersection distance. If we have this kind of intersection distance, then we can realize the um, outbound and inbound traffic. We can coordinate it both at the same time nicely. The more we deviate from this intersection distance, the more difficult it, it becomes to have inbound and outbound um, traffic coordinated. So basically it means if we, well, this would be the situation where, where the um, those yellow lines intersect at the intersection, then we can give the greenway to inbound and outbound more or less at the same time. If the yellow lines in the last diagram um, don't meet at the intersection, but somewhere off the intersection, then those green in inbound and outbound directions start to drift away from each other um, up to the extreme situation where we need them in uh, completely different time frames, and then it becomes very diffi difficult to get um, the crossing traffic into our signal program without very long cycle times. So that limits our uh, options for the timing for the stage sequence. Let's have a look at public transport and cyclists. I already mentioned we quite commonly have them on our streets, also on the major streets, um, and quite often we have them also in the mixed traffic, which makes it even more challenging. Um, to give you an example, I show you here um, some part of Berlin, the biggest city in Germany, about three million people living there. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see the public transport network. The red lines are the bus lines, which are uh, important in this case. The blue lines are subways, they're not important, they're underground of course, um, but the red lines are um, bus lines and what you can see if you look at some of the arterials, here you have a big arterial, you have bus lines on those arterials, but you also have bus lines crossing those arterials. Both of them are trying to be prioritized and you also have bus lines which run some irregular um, ways. So it might be that the arterial is through, but the bus enters the arterial and goes then with the arterial. And if you want to integrate the bus into the coordination, it's um, even more challenging. We do have bus prioritization in most cities in Germany and usually a very high priority. So usually the bus, we try to um, have preemption for buses so that they're very fast. Why is that? Um, here on the left side, you see some lost travel times of trams in the city of Dresden in Germany. And you see that about 20% of the whole, or 50% is the, the travel time itself. 20% is control delay caused by traffic lights. 20% is the dwell time at the um, bus stops. So you see the control delay makes quite a significant portion of um, the total uh, time the tram needs to travel through the network. And this we try to avoid. Historically, um, the major reason was that those travel time savings least lead to cost savings. You simply need less vehicles on those um, bus lines. And therefore you can, you can save a lot of money um, in public transport. That was historically one of the major reasons public uh, bus priority was introduced. But of course, um, there are more reasons. Um, we have a lot of interest to foster public transport for environmental, economically, and also social reasons. And I'm, I'm not getting tired to, to focus on that. If we're talking about capacity restraints in our network, public transport is the golden bullet. So it has a much higher capacity um, and it needs much less space than car traffic and even less cycle traffic. So if you just consider you have five seconds for one green bus, there are about 50 people in this bus, that would mean you would need nearly 80 seconds of green if all those people would sit in cars with an average occupancy of 1.3 um, persons per car. 
So you, may, you need much more space, much more green time if all those people would travel by car. And that's one of the reasons why we really want to foster public transport. So what does it mean for our coordination? The location of the bus stops is crucial for our coordination. Here you see basic coordination. And then you have basically two, uh, two options. Uh, I showed you here two examples with bus stops in different locations um, on your street network. So the bus arrives here. It has here its, net, its bus stop. Mind um, here the x-axis is the, the distance and the y-axis is the time. Opposite from what um, Tien showed, can be other way, other way around. It's a little, yeah, everyone makes it a little different. So the bus arrives here, has a bus stop, and possibly the dwell time can be accommodated during the platoon, the, the green time. And then it again joins the platoon and can still pass the next signal. That works if this green time is pretty long and the dwell time can be accommodated during this green time. In the next case, the bus stop is in front of the uh, signal, then the bus can stop during the red time and once the dwell time is over, it can enter again and can pass at green. So that would be the ideal situation, the two options we usually have to achieve coordination for buses. How about cyclists? If we look at progression speed of 50 kilometers per hour, which is currently the, the standard, and we introduce cyclists, then those cyclists are usually much slower. Even a fast cyclist, which goes at maybe 25, maybe 30 kilometers per hour, he, he might just be able to reach the next signal at green. A slow cyclist will not be able to reach green. He might be able or she might be able to reach the next cycle. But all the cyclists which have a travel speed between fast and slow, they will miss the green light. So they will not be able to have a coordinated signal. There is some research. Well, it's more exemplary, uh, more uh, pilot project research, but they try to uh, uh, improve, optimize some corridors, and they showed you can improve corridors for cars and cyclists at the same time. So it doesn't necessarily mean if you want to optimize those green splits and the offsets for cyclists that um, the coordination for cars doesn't work anymore. Um, but of course, you realize that it is a big challenge. One advantage is that we're getting increasingly pedilecs. And those pedilecs, what is a pedilec? A pedilec in Germany legally is a bike with electric support, which can travel or which is supported up to 25 kilometers per hour. And those pedilecs are considered bicycles. So they can use bike lanes um, and all the uh, legal requirements for bikes apply to them as well. And since they are getting more and more common, the variation of speeds of cyclists gets reduced. So more and more bikes travel at more or less 25 kilometers per hour, whereas the standard bikes without electric support, they will have quite a high variation between different speeds. So usually the average speed of cyclists is more like 15 kilometers per hour, but with a quite high standard deviation. Another thing we are discussing at the moment is whether 50 kilometers per hour on urban streets um, is a necessity. So um, currently we're discussing to introduce a general speed limit of 30 kilometers per hour. Well, discussing means uh, policymakers are quite reluctant to do that, but in the uh, expert circles, this is something which is um, seriously discussed. In the city of Darmstadt, for instance, they want to start a pilot trial to introduce it in, in the whole of the city. And then only the major roads will still have a speed limit of 50 kilometers per hour. And the speed limit of 30 kilometers per hour might offer new opportunities to accommodate cyclists in the signal timing and in the uh, coordination. So that might bring some changes. To the end of my presentation, a few words on how we optimize coordination. The guidelines recommend us, uh, guidelines mean the German Highway Capacity Manual, it recommends 
to use uh, exactly what, what Tien already introduced. So a probe vehicle which can pass um, the corridor without stopping, or ideally without stopping. So you use a few probe vehicles and that can be either re a real life test after introducing the coordination. It can also be realized by simulation runs. So usually uh, nowadays you will probably more and more switch towards simulation to be able to test it before you introduce it the single timing. And then um, you consider a very good coordination if 95% of, uh, of the intersections can be passed um, without stopping. But of course, there are alternative um, performance indicators which are based on average delay on the number of stops. So more kind of um, indicators which are also related to fuel consumption. One can question how long we will need them if we have electric vehicles, but at the moment, this is one of the alternatives. And the common um, software, I showed you here one example of one of the common softwares used in Germany. In, in the software, you can compute those kind of performance indicators based on certain kind of assumptions. So this is, of course, no full-fledged traffic simulation running in the background, but um, based on uh, basic heuristics and based on um, traffic volumes also from the minor streets. And then you can start uh, here on the right, you see the, the example for the different intersections, what the performance indicator would look like for this example. And then you can start moving your signal timings around, the green split around, the offset around, um, and then you can optimize those performance indicators. Of course, this can also be done in very basic heuristic ways automatically by the software, but then usually you optimize for the one direction first and then the, op op uh, the opposite direction, try to fit in the opposite direction. So the, the options are limited. And then you can overlay it with your public transport and then you will realize whether it works or it doesn't. In this case, it works pretty nicely actually. If you would overlay the cyclists also, then you would start realizing that it doesn't work for all of them. And then usually engineers start moving around their signal timings. They try to accommodate all the special situations for this example. So usually it's not really a computer procedure where you just push the button and then control, some control algorithm optimizes your signal control, but it's more manual process based on a lot of experience and trial and error. And one of the reasons is what kind, if you want to optimize it computer-based, that means you have to define a clear optimization criteria. And which should that be? I already mentioned a lot of indicators which are important. Stops by cars, delay by cars, stops by buses, delay by buses, stops of bikes, delay of bikes, delay of the pedestrians. And also the question of which direction do you optimize? Do you find a general optimization for all vehicles or do you put priority of direction? So this decision is already very complex. And if you would let that doing a computer doing it, then it's very hard to understand what the computer really does. And it's a big question whether that's really an optimal. So it's a big point for discussion. Um, maybe we will be able to address that in the book as well, or maybe in the presentation as well. And I um, should also mention one of the challenges I mentioned, delay of pedestrians. Delay of pedestrians in Germany, we consider delay of pedestrians acceptable if it's not much more than one minute, the maximum delay. And that means the cycle time is limited. Well, usually we try to limit it to 90 seconds. 120 seconds, two minutes is possible. It's, it's allowed according to the guidelines but we try to limit it to 90 seconds. And you can imagine 90 seconds, then you don't have a lot of options to optimize your plan here. So it's quite challenging. So I, looking at the time, I should come to the stop. Um, I will just briefly introduce um, the options of traffic actuation, but Thomas will go into more detail of that. So what we usually have is in addition to fixed time coordination, we have traffic actuation, traffic actuation, tries to, to make the signal control more efficient. And um, one of the major focuses on, uh, of traffic actuation is public transport. So what we do here is usually we have some kind of advanced green or green extensions 
if a bus arrives and at the intersection. So we have a core green time for our platoon. And then we have some variable times where we can either push in a separate stage or we can extend the green time or we start earlier with the green time in order to accommodate for the bus. How that works, um, Thomas will explain in his presentation, so I will skip it here at this situation. So let me finally conclude. So we have a lot of challenges for arterial coordination. We have cars, public transport, bikes, pedestrians, all of them we try to accommodate on our signals. We have no holistic optimization, but a very pragmatic, but also transparent approach. They say, um, as opposed to, to a dubiously optimized procedure, dubiously because sometimes it's hard to understand what the computer actually does. Traffic actuation is a big opportunity to make our signal programs, program more efficient and more flexible, but for coordination, it introduces, again, more challenges because that means our signal, as I showed it in the time, uh, time diagram, uh, is not as fixed as it looks like, but we have to take into account traffic actuation. So the number of buses which influence our signal program is important also for the optimization um, of our coordination, which makes it even more challenging. Thank you very much for listening. And if there are a few questions, I guess a few questions we can answer now. And otherwise we will carry on with Thomas' presentation. Thank you for your presentation. If you have a question, could you please raise your hand or write on in the chat? Yes, we have a question. <laughs> well, we have the question about the, the turning off of traffic lights at, uh, at night. Um, one question was, uh, do we turn off traffic lights at, at night? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Basically, currently we still do, but the safety research shows that this is really dangerous. So we try to avoid it. So our idea is, um, or the better idea is to have traffic actuated signals at light. That means they are more um, accepted, but that also means higher costs. So small cities, usually they switch off their lights if there's very low traffic volume. So the practice is, yes, they are switched off, but we know that it is a dangerous thing to do. So we try to avoid it. And second question was for the speed signs, how is the public acceptance of the recommended speeds, assuming you have sometimes a lower speed? Yeah, that's a big challenge. And the, the acceptance is not always good. So we know sometimes, um, that's the reason why we want to have 90%, uh, preferably 90 to 100% of, of the speed limit as a progression speed. If our progression speed gets lower, then usually the experience is that the acceptance is no longer there. Of course, there are some traffic participants who know how it works and they will drive slowly, but usually you always have a few vehicles who do not accept those speed signs and then it gets difficult to have a good coordination. So it, you can try to improve the coordination with this um, speed advisories, but it's not really the big solution which works everywhere. Yeah, and then the same, same question um, Chen already got, um, who is doing this kind of optimization procedure? And the answer is also the same. Um, big cities usually have a lot of specialists in their own government, um, in the local authorities who can do it themselves. But usually if you have bigger projects, then those are, um, you have a call for tender and then private organizations, private um, consultancies, do um, the optimization, do the basic procedures, and the city only um, makes the quality check and um, implements it in the end. But uh, little adjustments are done by the governments, quite often done by the governments or governments, the, the uh, local authorities themselves. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So let's move to the Thomas presentation. Okay, thank you. So I will try to focus a little bit more on Switzerland and Germany, even though it's very close. I will go to some more examples. And finally, I will try to give some uh, 
basic knowledge or basic ideas about how we do that traffic activation. So let me try to share my screen. There we go. So just before starting my PowerPoint, I always say Switzerland is kind of something like we could call detector paradise. Switzerland is very much focused on optimization. People do not really want to stop at an intersection without any reason. So Switzerland has a lot of detectors. Uh, Switzerland tries to optimize the traffic with uh, very small distances, very small cities, very close intersections. So I would say every intersection is somehow custom tailored. There are a lot of restrictions, as Axel just mentioned, we have uh, public transport, we have also stops in the middle of the streets and we need to serve the pedestrians in order to be able to go to the public transport. So it's kind of complex, but in that complexity, we need some basic rules, some basic understandings, and uh, yeah, let's go with the PowerPoint and try to give you some uh, ideas about uh, how we do it. So I will give some introductory examples from Zurich, Solothurn, and Basel. You just saw a city uh, in the city of Basel, a complex intersection. We will have a look at this later. Then uh, I feel the need to somehow start with NEMA because uh, I consider NEMA being a nice standard, and uh, we could say that everything we do in Europe is kind of generalized for NEMA. So I will try to start with NEMA and lead you somewhere in the open space of uh, more freedom, let's say. Then I will try to have a look at some traffic control modeling basics. Also, again, starting with NEMA and trying to uh, open the model to what we do. And I will finish with the word to priority treatment and public transport priority. And if you have time, probably we do not have time for reference. I have a, a collection of what can happen to your traffic, uh, to your signal plan when you do uh, this traffic activation. So I start with a very special city, the city of Zurich. The city of Zurich is a city where trans public transport is more important than individual traffic. Uh, I call that IT here, individual traffic. So the city is more or less driven by transport has to follow somewhere in there, but you cannot just say oh, we will stop individual transport. So individual transport needs to be treated as well, but in a second priority. They do it now since 20, 30 years. They are using very short cycle times, so they are down to 45 seconds, and you can only do that if your commuters are well trained and the approach I will show you here is uh, what is better and how to define your city with in the term of green waves, arterial roads, public transport, non-public transport, and I think best is I just show you the picture. This is uh, an area view of the city of Zurich, and now you have the black roads here, these are highways without intersections, so that's pretty easy. Then the green ones are individual traffic green waves where PT, public transport, swims with. We call that, we kind of swims with. And we have the blue ones, these are public transport green waves where the individual traffic swims with. And then we have some areas where nothing is really coordinated. It's just driven by the public transport. And these are some, uh, these two downtown areas where in fact, the only common base is cycle time. So everybody stays in the same cycle, in the same cycle time, and everybody tries to optimize without, uh, within these restrictions, the green opening times for between traffic and public transport. As Axel mentioned already, I have an example here where a bus drives on a green wave of individual traffic and it has a stop, stop 
in between two intersections. Uh, we call that this is a coordinated stop. And of course, this stop is here because it fits the green wave. So sometimes the control people tell the bus operators where to put the stops in order to have that green wave for all working nicely. And Axel already showed this picture uh, in a different way. I have some uh, I'm some simulations behind it, but what you have to look at is look at this possibility here. The bus stop is within the green band. So this is possibility one. And possibility two is now going to this. So the bus stop is while the green band is red. So you have two possibilities. And this is kind of the trick. If your cycle time is short, and if your green waves for individual traffic are nicely designed, then your public transport priority is kind of unnecessary because you offer a public transport vehicle window every half a cycle time. And half a cycle time in Zurich, this is 22 seconds. So it is accepted that uh, some public transport vehicle at the beginning of uh, one of the coordinated waves has to wait for 20 seconds. But one it's, once it's in, then it's in. And then it's coordinated, and then it runs through nicely that uh, green wave, even though it has been designed for individual traffic and not for bus. So I have some animations on that. I hope that goes through Zoom. Uh, these animations are coordinated and you can see at the same time now the bus arriving here at the bus stop. You see it in 3D up here uh, in the animation. You see now everybody runs and it's still green. And once you see here it's green, now it's it got to red. So it seems to be possibility two. So the bus stops. And once it goes to green again, the bus can go away. Can you see that or not? Any feedback? You see it moving? It's good, it's good. I can see it. Okay. Now, once it gets green, the bus can drive away. So, it's kind of a trick. You do not really feel the bus delay because the bus at the bus stop is uh, getting on and off passengers and at the same time waiting for green light. Okay, we skip the possibility two and go further. Second example, Axel already showed you that topology in Central Europe is weird. So this is kind of not so weird, but this is a small city. This is the city of Solothurn uh, in Switzerland. And you can identify here that there are some corridors. So you can try to do a coordination, but at the same time you have intersections far away, we have intersections roundabouts without any control. So as I said, things are custom tailored, things are empirical. What you don't see is that you have a little railway, in a light rail, you would call that, in between running here. And when it starts, it needs all the priority and even doesn't respect the roundabouts, but goes through. And then you have a lot of buses here because it's the railway station. So again, here, what is the basic understanding? The basic understanding is we have the same cycle time and we try to do our best within these restrictions. Or even worse, city of Basel, you do not really see a real structure grown, the old downtown area here. And here you can see in green that there are attempts of coordination of green waves. You could also see here, but this is on purpose not coordinated because there are so many streetcars and so many buses that they lead and car traffic has to uh, integrate with uh, what they do. So topologies in Europe are in such a way that you cannot use that chessboard uh, access and try to optimize anything offline. The only thing you can do is you can plan a green wave offline, you can plan a common cycle time, and then traffic activation does the rest. The weird intersection I just showed you before is up here. And we focus on that intersection again. This is, yeah, this is maybe not a typical intersection. It is kind of, kind of complex. 
and you see you need a lot of investment to, to control that intersection. You have 48 signal groups, so that means you have 48 individually controlled signal phases in NEMA terms. In order to control them, we do some abstraction. Uh, we use traffic streams. You see later on what that means. So you have 63 traffic streams driving over that intersections, bicycles, public transport, IDT traffic, whatever. And you need 124 detectors in order to control that. You have buses. Uh, you have trams, every minute you have a tram, every two minutes you have buses, you have uh, 3,500 cars going on, on the intersection, so it's kind of complex. And I have some movies here, I have a VSIM simulation, how that looks like. Uh, when you see the intersection, you see the main flow here, you see a streetcar which uh, goes through a terminal loop, you have another streetcar in both directions, uh, you have bicycles, you have pedestrians, you have really a lot of microscopic treatment of traffic on that intersection. Even though you could say, okay, nice, this is a coordinated intersection, but these are so closely coordinated that they run on the same program. So uh, we start, we have, a, we have a movie in order to show you this is not just fake. So we tried to represent whatever you have seen in Wissim. Uh, so we tried to base here you see on these terminal loop tramps, on these arriving tramps, this is rush hour, so it's kind of busy and uh, everybody is trying to get uh, priority. You have the pedestrians here, you have the bicycles here, so it's kind of crowded. Okay, so let's start with NEMA. We all have seen this scheme, so let's start with the, with the easier uh, four leg intersection. Uh, we have the stages uh, that result on NEMA. You can uh, lead uh, or lag or whatever you can start. So you can go over here or you can go over here. And at the barrier, you go from the main street to the side street. So pretty simple. So as I said, you have the barrier here and you have not so much of parameters uh, that you could change. Now we have a little bit more important and more interesting intersection, we identified that in Kunming, that also looks like kind of NEMA, but on this intersection we had buses in the middle here, and we have a lot of bicycles, and we have a lot of pedestrians, and if we apply a kind of generalized NEMA scheme, you can see here on the signal plan recordings that you can have a normal phase sequence, lead lag, that you can identify here, you see the nice rhythm, but if you give enough freedom to the control algorithm, you get something here that resurfaces certain directions. And nine and 10, these are the buses, so if you have a lot of buses, you reserve also the individual traffic which in fact is here the through traffic. And this is something which is not possible on the NEMA, but if you generalize the NEMA approach, you can resurface it. Of course, the driver expectation needs to allow for it, or maybe the legal uh, framework needs to allow for it, that you uh, leave the expected phasing sequence. And how can you go there? Uh, you can go there by introducing, Axel already mentioned it, uh, introducing an intergreen matrix that looks like this here. You have all movements, which says from movement to movement. So you have the clearing movement and the entering movement, meaning if movement two clears, you need five seconds of red in order to get uh, three that can enter. This is a pure geometric uh, task in order to make sure that the conflict points are not hit at the same time. So you need that intergreen matrix. And you see here another example. This is also kind of NEMA example, but what, what do the Europeans do? They put the streetcar here in the middle, and then they put the streetcar here at the side, and it has to cross it at the same time. So using some NEMA phases, you're lost. So somehow you need a generalization in order to cope with it. This is a Basel intersection. 
you define the stages just a little bit different view axel mentioned that already he showed it with arrows i show it here with the circles so you you define stages you define your stage sequences and finally you have a resulting signal trend uh, for this intersection and now comes the step the signal plan has a cycle time which here is 72 seconds and now you say okay i go from signal to signal frames and this is uh, an important term a signal frame you still can see in green and yellow the, 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 the signal behind it and the frame is now in blue and the frame tells you when you could be green and when you must be red. And the frame overlaps, even though uh, the movements are conflicting, and the frames are now filled, according to the actual traffic situation, are filled with the actual green and red switchings. And in order to do so, for example, the intergreen matrix must be known in order to generate legal stage sequences, stage transitions, and stages. So that's the basic generalization. Of course, you need detectors, and as I said, detector paradigms. You put also a lot of detectors in there, but as soon as you put detectors in there, you have to give them a role. So detectors have roles according to where they're placed and according to how long they are. So we are briefly touching the modeling basics. I just said detectors have roles. Uh, we see on the low part, we see the public transport detector uh, placements. We don't have a look at that now, but we look at the individual traffic. And I formalized that. And driving from the left to the right, you might encounter detectors very early to an intersection and they have different roles. So this role of the first one here is an inflow spillback detection. So these detectors try to find out how long is my queue. Then the next, the, 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 the violet ones, they are advanced call detectors. So if your intersection is red and you're hitting that detector, it should be in a good distance that you do not need to slow down and you can go over the intersection. So this is a group of advanced call detectors. And the green ones are extension detectors. You could call them dilemma zone surveillance detectors. So these detectors, they try to keep green open as long as there is traffic reasonably close to the intersection in order to avoid that somebody has to stop just before red and he could have passed the intersection. Then you have stop line detectors for all kinds of reasons. Maybe you did not have these detectors here and you just want to call on demand. And finally, you might even have on the other side of the intersections, you might have some outflow spillback detectors and these try to guarantee that if a traffic jam goes back to here, that you cut the red, you do not give unused green time, and you could use that time maybe for serving the side direction. The next slides try to show in the frames what they do, but I think we'll skip it. Uh, this is for my classes that I normally give, but the classes, they take much more time than just this introduction. Maybe another, Important term I would like to introduce, I just mentioned it, this is a traffic stream. And the traffic stream is the abstraction of a traffic lane because somehow you need to be able to distinguish between buses and priority treatment and normal traffic. And you can see here, this lane here, this lane is used by two different types of traffic. Yellow is individual traffic and red is bus traffic. And if you want to treat this traffic signal, which is common for both, in a different way when there are buses or no buses, then you need somehow to do that abstraction, who is at the moment driving my traffic light. And that's why we call these traffic streams. So in this example, we have two different traffic streams that are on the same lane. And of course, they need to be detectable. So you need a bus call detector. And according to what traffic stream is using the lane, you can adapt your control strategy. The signal frame, we already showed uh, a little bit. You have different regions where you can give green. I give you an example that might be filled like this. If you have not so much traffic, 
it might feel like this if you have a lot of traffic so you go until the end of the extension or in certain cases you might even be allowed to advance that green that leads to a signal frame plan not just a signal plan and in theory is if all the frames are open that means you have a fully traffic accurate operated that's not the subject here because then you could skip these frames but we use these frames here from restricted to anything in between you can see traffic stream two can always fall green so that might be a high priority traffic stream so with these traffic streams, you can assign the necessary priority to uh, the signal. Now, a last notion, we have a main pointer and we have a secondary pointer. The main pointer is just the next traffic stream to be chosen for green. And let's go to the example, if you go to the NEMA example, you can write down the NEMA facing in such a way and you say, okay, in the first step, I have a major pointer, which is traffic stream five, and traffic stream five could add one to it or could add two to it, which is not shown here. So, generalizing the NEMA scheme allows for more freedom if we give it at the end and let's go through to it so these are just different examples and let's go to the end example so here now you get the full possibility so at the end with this it looks a little bit complex major and minor screen scheme you are able to model NEMA but you can now add to these minor and major streams you can add whatever traffic is needed in addition like public transport pedestrians whatever so you can go into a generalization you need to find out what is the next major stream so i show that here so if you're Actuated control needs to find out who should be switched to next. He needs to find out who is the next major stream, who joins the next major stream. So then you get the stage and then you need to find out when to switch to this next stage and how to switch to the next stage. And then you have different strategies and we will not go into the details of these different strategies. Finally, priority rules. If you want to treat public transport, you need to go into different priority levels and how we usually do it we do first an optimization on all priority vehicles and finally we do an optimization on whatever is still possible as stages and we define a certain number of priority classes and then go through this always with the goal what is the next stage and when to switch to the next stage and i think we are slowly running out of time. I will stop here and just have you enjoy again uh, this horrible intersection. Uh, here we go. Just now in a light VSIM uh, simulation, you can see here uh, a streetcar goes to a stop. Of course, in a stop, we do not get parity. There's a bus coming here, going into a stop, not getting parity. Once you close the doors, the signal is transmitted to the intersection, then you ask for parity. Here we go, streetcar goes first, then the bus has to stop because there is a streetcar. Bus will be served next, bus will be served before traffic, so he can sneak in. And then finally, the traffic is also given green. The opposite traffic is already running. Just enjoy it for another half minute and then I will stop. Let me conclude. Everything is custom tailored. Everything is kind of complex. There are not really rules how to coordinate, except for, as Axel showed, try to put some green bands in imperial ways, try to agree upon a cycle time, and then try to do your best. 
And of course, doing the best is measuring quality, measuring travel time. But most of it is empirically done. Most of it is traffic engineers' experience because there is no standard layout. Everything is different. Everything is uh, custom tailored. The only thing we can do is we can try to formalize the terms like traffic streams, like major minor streams, like curfew rules whatever and then with this toolkit develop according to the rules we try to follow us let's stop it and let's give back the screen and let's go for some questions thank you thank you for your presentation with very complicated practical yes. application cases it yeah. was very interesting to see such a very difficult movement so this question, any questions? Yeah, I already said questions. Okay. So detection technology, sorry for interrupting, let's <laughs> speed up. So detection technologies, normally we use loop coils, so induction. This uh, turns out being the most uh, reliable. We have at certain places, we have cameras and the detectors are kind of well, well working if we discover failures which are done by the detective evaluation unit we can define replacement detectors and if we have too many failures we can go to some kind of emergency mode we just go to a cyclic control and we send somebody out to fix that problem within the next some hours then Tian has a question confirm that your simulation is using just one controller yes this is just one controller that is used and you can see uh, our approach so I'm not really a consultant, we are software manufacturers and we try to be able to handle these, these problems by parameters. So we try to uh, avoid programming and giving parameters to our customers. That's why we need mathematical models because if you want to define parameters for traffic control, then somehow you need to define what is priority, uh, how to handle uh, these different uh, issues. No. Yes, so Netherlands is very similar. The Netherlands was in the beginning, in the 90s, we had good customers in the Netherlands until they developed their own, the Reichswarte start developed their own and they gave the algorithm for free. But yes, we are very similar in our way of thinking. And now, yes, conditional priority, we can give it. It depends on how we can detect, detect the bus. Uh, if there's a bus detection system that can tell us uh, lateness or even how many passengers or whatever are in the bus, then we can put that bus to a different priority level. As I tried to show with these six different priority levels, we can move around. Normally ambulances have the highest priority level, but then we can have delayed public transport, on-time public transport. So yes, this can be handled and is handled differently, but it's rarely done because normally you have so much public transport and at certain moments of the day everybody has some delay that most of the cities gave up and they just handle on a first come first serve. Okay, so take the last question. Do you use yes, any intelligent, any intelligent technology? technology to optimize? Uh, no, the intelligent technology are the traffic engineers or whatever you want to use. So we normally at our company, we start once somebody has given a basic rhythm. So somebody has done what Axel has shown, some coordination, fixed time coordination, and then they tell us, so please start now at traffic actuation. And we start at that point, and we kind of don't care how the traffic engineer came to that point. And the last one, do you flash red lights? No. If we have a malfunction, we have a fast yellow blinking uh, with a two hertz blinking in order to show people, look, something is wrong. And then we switch off and after a moment we restart. And this is maybe a difference to Germany. In Switzerland, all intersections need to be designed to be safe without traffic control. And that's why normally at night we switch them off all because they are safe, except for some. So we cannot, for example, this intersection here is kind of unsafe if you switch everything off. So some intersections run 
that normally, legally, all intersections need to be safe without traffic control. So Thank I think that was the last question. Thank you. So as Professor Kesham Tang has also a question to you in the chat, but due to the time limitation, I would like to move to the case of China. So could you please write your answer in the chat afterwards? Okay. I will Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much for your presentation, Axel okay. and Thomas. So finally, we will have the cases in China introduced by Professor Wang Jin Ma and Dr. Chung Hui Yu. So Dr. Chung Hui Yu, you will present the, these cases. So could you please start sharing your screen? Yeah, thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay. Um, good afternoon and uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Chun Hui Yu and uh, I will present on behalf of uh, Professor Ma. Um, previous speakers have introduced much uh, technical details. Uh, the, um, the concepts and the procedures of signalization has much uh, similarity in China, so I will only introduce general ideas on some uh, practice in China. Uh, traffic congestion is uh, always uh, a big challenge uh, national uh, worldwide and uh, it lasts from the past to current and is likely to the future. Uh, it is a campaign that uh, may never be totally won, uh, but we are always on the way to a fight. Uh, in the first traffic light in China may be uh, installed in 1920s. Uh, that uh, traffic light has only two uh, indicators, red and uh, green. Uh, but as starts the history of road traffic control in the Chinese mainland. Before the 1970s, uh, more traffic lights were manually controlled. Uh, in 1973, uh, China had its first fixed time signal controller and the first actuated signal controller for, iso uh, for isolated intersections. Uh, in 1978, uh, China develop, developed uh, its first adaptive signal controller and it was applied to uh, green wave control in Beijing. Uh, later on, uh, China uh, imported uh, many foreign traffic controllers. Uh, SCAS and uh, SCOOTS may be the most famous. In 1990s, uh, in the seventh five-year plan, China developed uh, its first real-time adaptive signal control system. Uh, the research team was led by Chongqi University. Uh, after that, a uh, lot of uh, research institutes in China, uh, such as Chongqi University, Jilin University and the Institute of Automation of the Chinese Academy of Science developed a number of new traffic control controllers uh, to account for the characteristics of mixed traffic flow uh, prevailing in the Chinese mainland. However, most of these uh, systems are used for research purpose and uh, their pr uh, practical applications are fairly limited. Uh, among them, uh, there are several famous control systems. Uh, for example, the uh, in uh, in by uh, in traffic by Zhejiang uh, Subcom Information Technology uh, Company. Uh, it, it is the first implementation of such system to uh, by uh, bidirectional in, uh, green wave control in Hangzhou in the same year. Uh, Highcom uh, by uh, Highcom won the bidding for 2008 Beijing Olympics, and out that in 2017, uh, Didi and Baidu, uh, this, com uh, this internet companies proposed the uh, concept of internet plus uh, signal control. Uh, 
um, when we talk about arterial signal coordination, uh, grid wave control may be the most famous. Um, when we create a grid wave in one direction, uh, vehicles can uh, pass, uh, pass several intersections without stops. Uh, the uh, the um, because uh, and the procedure. I think the procedure of such uh, signalization is uh, similar with those in US. Um, but the characteristic of Chinese traffic flow is that uh, there are much there are many pedestrians and uh, bicycles. Uh, so uh, we can we can see uh, the uh, we have no pedestrians we have no buttons for uh, pedest uh, we have no buttons for pedestrians to uh, press uh, we all we always have signals for pedestrians as uh, in most places uh, we uh, ride turning vehicles are not controlled by signals. But in some places, uh, those road turning vehicles are also controlled. Uh, maybe uh, there are not available uh, extra. There are no extra lanes for those uh, road turning vehicles, and maybe uh, there are too many pedestrians and uh, bikes that conflict with those uh, road turning uh, vehicles. Um, another. Uh, Practice is the uh, pedestrian ex uh, exclusive phase. Uh, in that phase, uh, only pedestrians can uh, cross the uh, can uh, use their uh, crosswalks, and the other uh, vehicles will wait. Uh, the traffic uh, engineering handbook was published in 1998. Uh, it may be the first handbook. Uh, for the guidance in practice. Um, creating a green wave in one direction is relatively easy, uh, but having green waves in both directions is much more difficult. Uh, as introduced by the previous uh, speakers, we have many uh, algorithms and uh, tools. Usually, uh, such uh, Eureka coordination is done by uh, control systems like SCATS and uh, SCOOT. Uh, there are also uh, some uh, Chinese companies that have developed uh, commercial control systems. Uh, but uh, according to a report by ITA China, the uh, market share is uh, less than 50%. Uh, green waves control aim to allow continuous traffic flow over several intersections. Uh, red wave control uh, is to stop flow at each traffic light. Uh, it looks like uh, having negative impacts on traffic flow. So uh, why do we need uh, red waves? Uh, in this figure, uh, we have one bottleneck intersection. Uh, it is uh, heavily congested, and uh, uh, there are a lot of demand in the westbound direction. Uh, then we can use red, uh, red wave control to slow down the traffic to arrive at the congested intersection. Uh, it helps uh, in the alleviation of the congestion at the bottleneck intersection. Uh, here the uh, here another uh, example. Uh, we have uh, one congested region on the uh, arterial is the main road to uh, main road for traffic to get into and uh, get out of the uh, region. Then we may combine uh, red wave control and uh, green wave control to um, uh, <coughs> to alleviate the congestion in this area. Uh, because China has a large population and uh, our uh, the government is making efforts to develop uh, Chinese transportation. Therefore, uh, bus priority control is another important uh, practice in China. Uh, due to uh, uh, 
uh, limited uh, due to due to limited uh, limited uh, resources and increasing vehicles uh, transit is favored by the government. It is reported that uh, one uh, bus is equivalent to uh, sixty private cars in terms of passive capacity, and the bus priority control is an effective way to uh, support the development of transit. Uh, in China, uh, in 230 cities in China, uh, there are around uh, 10,000 kilometers of bus exclusive lanes. But the uh, control delay at, in, uh, at intersections uh, is still more than 20% of the total travel time. Uh, because uh, not er uh, because uh, not every uh, every intersection has uh, a bus uh, priority control. And uh, uh, the uh, operated uh, bus uh, priority control may not be proper. Uh, generally, we have uh, three kinds of uh, bus priority control passive uh, control, active control, and adaptive control. Uh, in a passive control, we use uh, fixed time signal uh, timings. So uh, we don't have, uh, we don't need to use uh, detectors. Uh, we usually uh, use shorter cycle lengths and uh, assign more uh, green time to the phases during which uh, the bars arrive. But uh, due to the, because of the fluctuations of check flow and the interruption of pedestrians and uh, bicycles, uh, the URA cannot work as expected. Uh, then in the active bus priority uh, control, uh, we need to detect, detect buses as they approach the inter uh, intersection and then adjust the signal timings dynamically to improve the service for buses. Uh, there are many methods, uh, green extension, uh, red truncation, and uh, actuated transit basis may be the most, uh, most commonly used. Uh, phase in, uh, insertion and uh, phase rotation has, uh, have, have large negative uh, impacts on traffic flows and is rarely used. Uh, in adaptive uh, bus priority control, uh, we will, con will consider assessment measures like the stop of buses, uh, the delay of buses, and the delay of other traffic modes like private cars and stations. Uh, in Shanghai, we have bus line 11. Uh, it, had, uh, it had dedicated lanes and uh, signal uh, project control. Uh, in the radio, uh, this bus is approaching the uh, intersection. Now the uh, traffic light is red for the bus, then the uh, uh, this bus is, is uh, send a request to the controller, and the controller switch the traffic lights from red to uh, green. So uh, uh, the, bar, the delay of the bus is reduced. Uh, however, uh, in in China, uh, bus priority control is mostly operated independently at each uh, intersection even in a coordinated arterials in many uh, control systems. Uh, for example, uh, we have three uh, trajectories. In, uh, in, uh, for trajectory one, we give uh, three extension, uh, phase insertion, and uh, no priority. Uh, for, uh, for trajectory two, uh, we use phase insertion, uh, red truncation, and uh, no pro priority. Uh, for trajectory three, uh, we don't give um, bus priority, but the delay uh, is the same. That means uh, if uh, bus priority can, uh, bus priority control is not uh, properly operated, uh, bus cannot get expected benefits, but other traffic may have uh, large delays. Uh, another uh, challenge is multiple uh, requests. Um, currently, most systems only consist a single uh, request. 
and with um, okay um, with the development of uh, new technologies like connected uh, vehicles, uh, more and more attentions uh, have been paid to uh, internet uh, plus signal control. Uh, although for, um, gas systems are installed in Shanghai for the detectors, uh, you already don't work well and uh, some uh, controllers, uh, some adaptive controllers still work as fixed, uh, fixed timing control. Um, due to the high cost of uh, installation and the maintenance of such uh, infrastructure based detectors, uh, people realize that a uh, proper vehicle can be used, utilized uh, uh, to uh, supply the cost effective data for signalization. Um, to use um, trajectory data of proper vehicles in signalization, uh, the most challenging may be the low penetration rate. Uh, and this research is a hot topic. Uh, how to capture the characteristics of the whole traffic flows on the basis of sample trajectories and how to uh, model the evolution of the traffic uh, flow with uh, varying, tra uh, varying signal timings. Uh, many studies are being carried out in this direction, but uh, mainly uh, for research purpose. Uh, DD uh, has tried uh, uh, has tried their uh, signal op uh, optimization algorithm in Jinan based on uh, their trajectory data. Uh, the penetration rate is around is uh, around uh, uh, five percent, and they their results showed that um, before the optimization, the average speed is around uh, eight kilometers per hour. After the optimization, the speed can increase. The average speed can increase to 20 kilometers per hour. Uh, but due to uh, their business secrets, um, really uh, no details, uh, no technical details are reported yet. Uh, with connected vehicles, we can also uh, combine uh, bus signal priority control and uh, speed advisory. So we can also uh, optimize uh, uh, dwelling time at bus stops and give uh, advisory speed to uh, uh, optimize uh, delay uh, and uh, fuel consumption, like eco driving. Uh, last is the uh, application uh, with CVs. Uh, CV technology has made uh, uh, has made a uh, traffic control lot fancy. Uh, by two Apo uh, Apollo may be the most famous open source project in China. Uh, it can uh, combine uh, 5G, uh, automated uh, automated vehicle technologies and uh, uh, signal control. But they most uh, famous on uh, single vehicles, and they have tested their automated uh, vehicles on open road. So how to uh, cooperate uh, multiple vehicles, and how to cooperate uh, multiple vehicles and uh, uh, signal lights uh, remains a challenge. You work. Uh, AV technology. Uh, maybe first commercial lights for bus uh, operation uh, because uh, we have a uh, bus dedicated uh, lane and uh, signal priority. Uh, Rihong uh, is a Chinese manufacturer of commercial vehicle uh, in China. It, ha uh, it has tested its uh, automated buses uh, on the open road. This video shows how it uh, works. But uh, it is still a long, uh, a long journey to uh, uh, a long journey to populate AVs. Uh, okay. Uh, but we we uh, we think we are always on the way to the dreams. So our dream that uh, all the traffic uh, participants can. Uh, work in an organized way.
Okay, uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for your nice presentation, Junhui. So, is there any question to his presentation? If you have, please write in the chat or raise your hand or unmute and uh, directly talk. Okay, I have a question. The case in China, the video seems like much more demand than mm -hmm. the other countries. And uh, I remember Axel mentioned like applicable traffic volume for coordination is like 85% of the capacity or something like that. So in China, is there any such kind of, how can I say, the applicable maximum traffic volume or volume capacity ratio for coordination in the guideline or in when implementing? Um, I think uh, actually in in big cities in China, uh, the demand uh, is usually always very very large, yeah. and yeah yeah, uh, especially in the uh, communi uh, uh, I mean, in in corridors, uh, new waves. Commuting, yeah, in a commuting corridors, uh, green waves uh, can be used to uh, to uh, make the uh, progressing uh, flow go smoothly. Go smoothly. Mm -hmm. So it's still better than without coordination, even the demand is quite high condition. Yeah, we will uh, we'll coordinate the uh, signals in the direction with large demand. Okay, okay, thank you. So let's take the question from the chat first from Long Men. So if there are several buses of all or four approaches for one intersection, how can you manage this? Which approaches us will be given priority? This is the first question. I can't see the chat box now. I'm loading. So the question is if multiple buses are coming from different mm -hmm. approaches, which yeah. one should be prioritized? Um, this is a question that has not been totally solved. It may depend on how uh, the decision makers. Uh, it depends on the decision makers. Yeah, for, for um, like BRT maybe has the priority over uh, regular buses. Okay. Thank you. And the next question is from Maria. Thank you for your presentation, not directly coordination related, but do you also have CV cyclists, so cyclists with bicycle apps on their mobile phone, communicating with signal controllers? I'm sorry? Do you have the bicycle with kind of connected functions mm -hmm. to signal controllers? No, not yet. Uh, in China, bicycle bicycles are not coordinated. I may guess in Netherlands they have. That's why she asked this question. I'm not sure. Okay, the, the next one. May I ask how will the signal coordination strategy for fully homogeneous CUV differs from one that is of homogeneous traffic mix? What challenges do you foresee in the transition phase with higher CA proportions to devise an effective signal phasing plan? Oh, can you see my screen? It seems I found funny.
can you repeat that question? I can't see. Okay. Yeah, how, what's wrong with the EP? Yeah. How will the signal coordination strategy for fully homogeneous CAV differs from one that is mixed traffic? Mm -hmm. With pedestrian, mixed with pedestrian and bicycles? Mixed with CAV and normal vehicles, I guess. Oh, okay. Um, actually, it it is uh, it is a hot research topic and has not uh, put into practice now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I guess so. So the last one is how to improve vehicle safety or avoid vehicle collision inside the intersection through proper signal design. Uh, I think the the um, the the way the uh, the way to uh, guarantee safety is uh, similar to the practice in uh, in the United States. We will use the uh, clearance time between two conflicting uh, phases. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your. Answer and the presentation. I think the questions are I accelerating. Okay, please answer. <laughs> Sorry for not it's noticing. Easier if I just ask it directly. On one of the slides, you showed uh, one of the um, control algorithms by some software. Yeah, exactly this one. Mm -hmm. And there, they used very different speeds, progression speeds for every. Um, single section of the road and I was wondering whether that well and the speeds were pretty low at that um, mm -hmm. Does that work in any any way? Do people accept that understand that? Uh, that's like a question. Yeah, it will give some like give their uh, suggest, uh, suggested uh, speed and usually people will follow uh, these suggestions Okay, so it's It's not really research uh, which uh, control whether it's working or not, but it's more kind of idea yeah. behind the optimization. Okay, thank you. Yeah, th this uh, figure is from the field practice. Yeah, okay. okay. Well, thank you for your presentation. So, I think it's better to start our group discussion for overall. So we listen to three the cases from US, Germany, Switzerland and China. So we may find many different systems or approaches. So is if there are questions regarding the how can I say understanding of the whole approach or the advantage or disadvantage of the different approaches, could you please give some questions? Uh, may I? Yeah, please. I have a, a common question for all the speakers. I just want to know the proportions uh, of arterials are currently operated with coordination. You, of course, it's hard to have a very you know detailed statistics on that. But can you also uh, please give some us in examples? For example, in some cities, in your city, how is the situation? Uh, Am I clear with the question? I mean, basically, it's, I'm asking how many sessions are operated, how how many of the percentages are, I mean, are operated by the coordination. Yeah, thank you. Yes. So, Professor Tian is still here. I think he left. I'm a, uh, here. Okay. okay. I'm right. still. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for staying in the night, please. Answer to yeah, I'm I, I'm here, but I need to move to another room because my wife is sleeping. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. So your question is uh, what percent what percent of the traffic signals are in coordination? Right? In, yes. Or say uh, yeah. how many? How is the percentage of arterials? I mean, is in a mode of coordination control? Yeah, mm -hmm. I I would say in the U.S. Uh, I would say about probably ninety percent. Ninety percent of the signals are somewhat uh, connected, 
So coordination, you know, I mentioned coordination uh, is not running throughout the whole day, but during the peak hour, and then the signals will run coordination at night. It will run fully actuated, but the signals with coordination connection and capability, my best guess is probably around 90%. Thank you. Are, are Maybe I can talk. I can talk for, for Switzerland. Uh, in Switzerland, if you call coordination agreeing upon the same cycle time uh, and uh, running traffic actuated by these restrictions, I would also say maybe 90%, 95 run with the same cycle time. If you say coordination is really coordination, so trying to, uh, to put uh, the cars to the system by green waves and so, I would say we have small systems about three, four intersections being together and they represent maybe 15% of the cities and everybody else is just agreeing upon the same cycle but not being coordinated in, in that restricted way. So same cycle time about 90% but really being coordinated let's say in, in, in an EMA way 15. Axel, what would you mean in Germany? Yeah, I would. Uh, well, I, I don't. Uh, I doubt that there is any statistics on that, so <laughs> it's hard to say uh, representatively. But um, my feeling is the same. That um, common cycle time is in Germany. Is, uh, usually, you have a common cycle time in the whole of the city, with few exceptions. Um, then you have the corridors, the major arterials where you try to coordinate them. Um, but still, you have many materials where the coordination simply doesn't work for the reasons I explained. Um, so even if you try, you will, not uh, you will not be able to realize it. And those corridors where the green wave actually works nicely, it's probably something like 10%, 15% might be. Yeah. Yeah. How about in China? Uh, I think it's either difficult to give um, uh, accurate number. But, uh, my feeling is that uh, maybe 70%. Okay, maybe I, I, sh I should say something about China, I guess. <laughs> you know, I, I have done my, uh, more, more, I've seen probably more cities signal coordinations than, than quite a few of, uh, uh, quite a few people. Uh, in China, it's, it's very strange. You know, uh, I know in your presentation, you showed a lot of very uh, advanced technologies, um, but the, those are, um, the majority of them I know is, is still just research, still under research stage. So if you look at the current situation, current practice, major cities, so they all, um, imported those uh, adaptive control systems, SCAT, SCOOT. So a lot of major cities, in, in fact, you look at the, in China, and many, many major cities, they implement the adaptive system. But although you call it the adaptive system, they don't maintain the detection. So most of them are running a fixed time. And then fixed time, I'm just using a, a, a city, uh, Wuhan, as an example. You know, Wuhan, they, they, had, they have scoot. So when I visited Wuhan, I said, can you show me a corridor where you are running coordination? And they couldn't show me. So basically, each intersection is running at a different cycle. So there's no coordination with, with, uh, with a, a scoot system uh, implemented, but uh, mainly running isolated. Then in Shanghai, Shanghai is a, a scat. Okay, so I would say most of them are coordinated, but although, uh, yeah, uh, it, it, the, the, the coordination, you may argue the effect, is, is that really good coordination or bad coordination? But I think in, in Shanghai, the majority of them are coordinated. I, I have to say that way. Um, then you look at the, the cities, you know, not these major cities, uh, go to some, some cities, uh, we call it uh, second tier, right? Second tier, third tier, mainly population with 
you know, everything in China you, you, you say is a, a not a big city, but it's compared to other countries, it's actually it's big. With 2 million people, those cities are actually considered the second tier. And then those signals are again running fixed time, but no coordination. So, so my best guess in China, coordinating the signal probably around 50%. That's kind of my guess, or maybe even less. Okay, thank you for your additional comments. And we have a comments from the floor. Matt Luca in Utah, Utah, USA, approximately two thirds of the traffic signals run some types of coordinated cycle during peak hours of the day. Okay, most of the remaining signals are capable of coordination but are geographically isolated or are requiring unique cycle lengths and wouldn't benefit from coordination. And from Maria in the Netherlands, some years ago, 85% of the intersections are controlled with vehicle actuated control without coordination between intersections. 13% are fixed or partly fixed for green waves. 2% is traffic dependent. Okay. okay. Thank you for you a lot of information. Okay, I think you can check in the chat. Okay. Okay. And we have a, oh, so Professor Tan, do you satisfy from the answers? <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's good to know that those numbers actually. They help us to have a, you know, global picture about this technology, how it is implemented in different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for, for the case of China, I guess uh, Professor Tian's comment uh, is, is his guess is correct. Uh, maybe slightly lower than 50%, I would guess. Uh, in the big cities, most of the intersections, uh, I mean, those big intersections are actually coordinated, but with a fixed timed control model, as Professor Tim mentioned. Even they use those advanced systems like SCATE, SCOOT, uh, when using coordination, those systems have to have to be kind of uh, degrade to, to a fixed time model. So that's my my uh, experience. And I noticed that in the flow, the, uh, Daniel is asking a question for our presenters. Uh, Elsa, can you can you repeat? Yes. 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 Is sufficient time given by road authority to optimize in the traffic signals? Are the signals optimized for is enough time dedicated to coordinating signals? That is his question. So, if there is an opinion from the presenters. Sorry, just that. Okay, Daniel, what, what is the question? Sorry, Daniel, yeah, basically the I'm question. I'm not a look at. Oh, okay, Daniel, can, you can yes. ask. Thank you. Just um, thank you all for the presentations. Awesome. I'm just wondering, in your opinion, do the road authorities in your various countries dedicate enough time to optimizing signals? Or would you say that they're not operating as good as they could? Or no, we're doing a great job and they're all optimizing perfectly. Um, I'm just wondering from your opinions, do we put enough time and effort into this multi-billion dollar congestion problem? Um, I think I would answer uh, you're a pastor, Axel, go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it addresses uh, some, some uh, topics which were mentioned already or which were uh, indicated already. So one thing is, um, I would say in, in Germany, most of the effort is spent on traffic actuation, not on coordination. So the actuation is the more important topic as compared to coordination, I would say. And um, usually it's about the quality management you're asking. So basically the, the people, well, they usually, once they make the signal control, they spend some effort to coordinate it in certain cases. So if there is a corridor where they say it's worthwhile to coordinate it, then they will usually ask the consultancies to, to make a nice coordination, and they will do their best to do it following the procedures I mentioned. But then usually those signals run for many years, and, and the coordination will not be 
checked again for whether it still works, whether the, the traffic volumes changed and so on and so on. And that not only applies to coordination, it also applies to the traffic actuation. Usually those traffic actuated programs, they run for many years, sometimes even decades without any adjustments. If there is not any indication that something goes wrong or the signal doesn't work or there are very long spillbacks or this kind of, of uh, hints from the population, for instance, or they realize. So I would say quality management is still very hot topic. It costs a lot of money. They need a lot of resources and they don't have those resources. So the, the answer to your question would be no. Um, I'm sure there is still a lot of room for improvement in most cases. Thomas. Yes, Axel, I cannot really add something. I wanted to say the same thing. So the same <laughs> thing applies to Switzerland. Maybe a, a little detail. Uh, the German and the Swiss cities, they, most of them, or many of them have implemented uh, kind of high-tech systems where they can log whatever detection, whatever uh, signal group, uh, signal light change happens with a resolution of one-tenth of a second. So these are our OCIT systems. And now for the first time, they really have a lot of data where they can really see what the detectors do. And often they are kind of surprised that even though the detectors are doing not the best job, it worked in the past. So detectors may oscillate, detectors may do make uh, wrong detections, whatever. So uh, I think Germany and Switzerland, they're now having the technical abilities of looking in the raw signals that were used until now for the control in that box, in that controller, but never on the central level. And that might maybe give a next step in quality because you can really check the detection quality that leads to sometimes strange control decisions. But this is kind of, this is on the edge because they now have this system finished. So the technology is there. Now you have to fill the technology with some uh, procedures and you have to use it. Okay, that's what I want to do. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, maybe maybe I can something I can say something about the U.S. situation. Yes, please. Hopefully, you can still hear me, but, but I'm not in front of my computer. Um, well, in, in in the U.S., so I don't know whether you 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 heard about. In fact, um, the the uh, Texas. Texas Transportation Institute, they did a national survey. So basically they gave a, a great, they, they uh, evaluated different aspects. You know, uh, what was the staff level? How often you check your signal system? How, how well are you maintaining the signal system? So that they call it the signal uh, reporting card. So the score, <laughs> overall score, I, if I remember correctly, it's somewhere between C and D. So, you know, A is the best, B, C, D, right? So I think it's close to, to D minus or some a D, D plus, that, that level. So from that point of view, so definitely you can see there, there's definitely room, um, bigger room to improve, right? So when Axel Thomas, talked about a detector, you know, they, they spend most of the time maintaining the detection actu actuation. In, in that respect aspect, the U.S. is doing very well. That, that this is what I can say. So the detection, if there's a problem, people complain, they immediately fix it. Okay, I think uh, probably 90% of the signals we have detection detectors and they maintain the detectors very well. That part I can say. But in terms of coordination, okay, in terms of coordination, in my point of view, I think there's a long way to go, still a long way to go. You know, there, there are places, they do have annual funding. So I can give you an example, probably the richest place is Southern California, Orange County. So the the population there is about uh, three mil three million or so. Um, they budgeted 
So for 30 years, so 300, uh, 500 million dollars for 30 years to just upgrade, maintain their signal systems, including equipment and retiming. So that's the richest place. You can see on average every year, they have $12 million. Uh, they have, uh, I think about 12, uh, at least over a thousand signals. So they spend a lot of time, right? Um, but then there's, there are other places not so rich. So maybe for, for many years, they don't even look at their signal, the coordination, although they do maintain their detection, but not the coordination part. So it's really uh, depends. But in conclusion, I think there's still a, a, a bigger room to improve. That's kind of my point of view. Thank you. Thank you for your comments about the US. How about China? Professor Tan or Chun Fui, could, do you have any comments regarding this aspect? I have no further comments on this. But China, China is, is probably investing the most, spending the, the, their, their expenditure, the money they spend is probably even more, more, more than here in the US. You, you, you saw those presentations, the kind of research they are doing, the, uh, the, those major companies, DD, Baidu, Gaude, uh, so all of those major companies, so the, the, the kind of uh, investment they made try to make uh, smart systems. So in that aspect, they did invest a lot. But mm -hmm. uh, the major issue is uh, the research. What about the actual mm -hmm. result? Mm -hmm. If you even don't maintain the detection system, no matter what advanced system you implement, but if you don't maintain the basic elements, the detection system, you're not going to achieve a good operation. So that's the kind of situation in China. Axel, do you want to say something? Yeah, I, I would like to, to add something to that. Well, um, that's one of the reasons this detection issue is one of the reasons that Germany prefers those basic principles, because the more sophisticated the system gets, the more detectors you need and the more prone to errors it becomes. So the system is more resilient if you don't depend on many detectors. Also in the traffic actuation, usually we try to incorporate some kind of redundancy. So if one of the detectors fails, that you still have some fallback from system which recognizes its error mistake or at least falls back to a program which still accommodates all the traffic streams so that nobody has to wait for minutes without being served. And I would like to add something else. The, the big question for me is also, um, Optimizing signal control is one thing, but we are talking a lot about um, car traffic. So that's one of the issues, car traffic and maybe public transport. It's very hard to incorporate pedestrians and cyclists in this kind of optimization. So the big question is, what do we want to optimize? In the end, we want to optimize the mobility of the people. And that's, that means it doesn't really matter which kind of transport mode they're using. And that makes it even more difficult. And the second issue is, um, what about rebound effects? Even if we do find an optimization algorithm, it might lead to shifts in modal splits in the city. So if we have a very good coordination for a corridor, it can mean that more people are using this corridor by car and less people using the bike, using public transport. And therefore, the idea of the optimization in the end doesn't work. That's something we often see if we try to reduce emissions. We try to improve em emissions by optimizing traffic flow for cars. And for this reason, optimized traffic flow means more cars and therefore we have more emissions. And in the end, we don't end up with the same emissions we had before the optimization. So my impression is there's a lot of money going into this technological solutions mainly directed at, uh, at car traffic. But in the end, the big questions are different questions, and they are not technological questions. And this is, for me, the big challenge for the next years. How do we deal with that? But that goes beyond what we will achieve in our book, of course. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for writing up very important aspects. I think it's globally important to how we can reduce the individual 
car traffic and the prioritize more public transport pedestrian and so on i hope the book can also cover such kind of consideration for pedestrian public transport because the methodology introduced today also sub have some something about the consideration of these different travel modes okay because we are over time already but the discussion is very fruitful i guess and we can continue hopefully to the second workshop so i would like to give the, the give back to the professor tan for your closing okay um it is not really a closing but uh, some notes for for the second workshop first of all uh, thank you all the speakers for your uh, excellent presentations and also all the audience for joining us today and um, i hope that you have enjoyed this workshop and uh, uh, have what you wanted to have for, for the discussions and uh, these presentations <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to uh, ask our speakers to send your slides to me, if you agree. And since we want to put your slides and the video together at the website of 62 uh, for sharing with our society. So I will announce uh, later uh, about where we are going to put the video and the slides. So please, our speakers, send, send me your slides. That's one thing. The second, I hereby invite all the audience uh, to join us at the second workshop scheduled on January 26th uh, in the year of 2021 after the new year season. And uh, the details for this uh, workshop will be announced later by emails. And, and I hope our SIG members and also friends can join us again. Uh, for the third one, lastly, for the third workshop, we have we haven't uh, have a can I say uh, concrete ideas for that. So just uh, give me ideas if you have any about the topic, about the the the, the can I say uh, what 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 the candidate speakers might be suitable for this workshop. Okay, so I think. Uh, that is all for, for my uh, uh, ending. And since the time is already, uh, I think, uh, very behind the schedule. So with this, I'd like to close the workshop today. And uh, thank you very much again for the speakers and the audience. So thank you. Thank you, too. Take care. Thank you, thank you Axel. Thank, thank you, you, Thomas. Thank you, Chen Hui. Professor Chen, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Axa, for moderating. Yes. OK, then see you. I will close the room. Bye-bye. Good night. Have a good Bye. day. Thomas, you have to start work right now. Yes, you see, it's daylight now. So, so we, we, are, we are now, coffee. yes. Yeah. <laughs> now you. it's nice here now. Yeah, I enjoy you. the snow now. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Nice way to get awake this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Good yes. morning. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.